The 80-20 way enables anyone to get extraordinary results without extraordinary effort. A small amount of our energy leads to most great things in our lives. A small portion of our time leads to most of our happiness and fulfillment. Preface. If ever you knew you always can get more great things that life has to offer with less offer t with effort and cost, would you be interested? If you could work a two-day week and get much better results than pay in a full-time week now, would you be interested? If you could find simple solutions to your problems by following a way that always works, would you be interested? If there was applied not only a way of making a living, er earning money, finding success, and also being more important in other areas of your life, would where people would love you and care for you as well as your happiness and fulfillment would you be interested of course you would and you can transform your life and follow the 80-20 way the 80-20 way involves a real change in how we see things and do things yet follow the 80-20 way is simpler and easier than if you have any of the right to expect how come if we understand the way the world is really organized even though it may be completely opposite of what we expect we can fill it out in a way to get much much more of what we care about with much less energy by doing less we can enjoy to achieve more this book is about action but less action this is an interestingly practical book and also a very unusual one but it has concerning for less action rather than more as has been observed for many times it's possible to make real improvements in our lives unless we do things differently that's true but the 80-20 way is also shows on how we can do less in total when we do we do more with things that make us happy but since they're all small proportions of everything that we do we can only do a few things in total and still transform our lives we will think more, do much more, a few things, and do better with more interesting things, and do much less overall. How I stumbled across the 80-20 way. I can sing the praises for the 80-20 way and say something hesitation about how miraculous it is because I did not invent it. The 80-20 say is based on scientific law called the 80-20 principle, which has been proven to work in business and economics and say the essence of 80-20. 80, 80 percent of the results come from 20 percent of your causes and effort. 80 to 20 principle my earlier book explained how to use the concept and increase company efforts I also included a short section explaining the 80-20 principle could work in our personal lives to increase success and happiness this application to individuals caused tremendous controversy some critics say that it was a perfectly respectable business idea that would never work outside business yet reader who's tried to wrote it say that the principle has changed their lives the 80-20 principle has been translated into 22 languages, sold well over half a million copies starting in this book published by the business houses sitting in the business shelves and bookstores. It also become an appropriate for a self-help book. The idea seemed to work so well with readers it tried to tell it helped the lives of friends who read the book who told their friends starting the word of mouth sensation seven years later I received a steady and increasing stream of letters and emails from people everywhere around the world from you which mentioned they mentioned for business simply to say that the big idea has done their happiness and effectiveness it's helped them concentrate with few relationships and issues and really important to them and increase their sense of freedom turbo boosted their careers and enabled them to escape a rat race treadmill using the principle they say it's taken away the guilt that they used to make them waste time working with the hard things and what were not important to them. The 80-20% principle has took them back in touch with who they are and what they really want out of their lives. It's certainly true for me personally. The 80-20 principle helped me realize what is important to me. In 1990, I ditched a conventional career, quit being a management consultant, and started living fully again. I was fully and I had to remain fulfilled for the which I had a new work to do, but I resolved my life and drove my work not only another way around. Since then, I've worked extensively on projects, writing books, being a lazy entrepreneur, but which means I mean creating new business, but not doing of anything the hard work myself but only if they excited me with the exception of a year-long assignment in South Africa I've held a proper job since my decision has always been allowed to large tracts time for the family and friends sheer enjoyment of life I have homes in London Cape Town sunniest part of Spain and of course in time to each place I can enjoy them often very good friends staying for several months and yet I'm not retired by objectively standard I'm achieving far more with extremely relaxed lifestyle than I ever did when I worked all the hours God sent I'm utterly convinced that anyone can benefit hugely by working less and fulfilling their passions more rebalance your life you not only have to create a greater health and happiness but you probably lead to far greater success however do you find success good to the 8020 books the 8020 principle introduces the idea behind the 8020 way originally intended mainly for business readers how do I use the 8020 principle to raise the profits of my corporation and to do more effectively personally the 8020 individual for managers and entrepreneurs how can I use the 8020 principle professionally to create a wealth and well-being as an individual the 8020 ways for everyone how can I use the 8020 principle personally to become a happy and successful person living the 8020 way work less worry less succeed more enjoy more contents part one introduction part two making living and a life part three making it happen what's the big idea 
Why this new book? Why this new book has been written if it hadn't been for two people? Steve Gorowski, a friend who runs a restaurant in Cape Town, and Steve is a bright dynamic, full of life, and very savvy. I was taken back when he said, tried to get the 80-20 principle, found it too difficult, couldn't get beyond page 10. You're kidding, I said. No, really, he said. All those numbers, professor statistics, and all that stuff, it's a great book. I tried to get the hang of it, but I failed. Then I realized that Steve hadn't failed. I'd failed Steve. So I thought of the way the book to make it breezy and easy. Part 1. Introduction. What's the big idea? It is not necessary to do extraordinary things to get extraordinary results. Warren Buffett. It is not necessary to do extraordinary things to get extraordinary results. Modern life is a mistake. I'm not talking about the marvelous progress from which we've made science, technology, and the business and which enabled us to eat better, stay younger, live longer, conquer disease, travel easily, enjoy greater comfort in an earlier generation. It's, it's just the way that we organize our personal and social lives. That's a mistake. Instead of working to live, we live to work. If we had more self-confidence in the right philosophy, we would accomplish more than we ever do now, enjoy more work, yet labor far, far fewer hours and conserve a larger part of our energy for our family and social lives. This would be a major change in how we experience life. Here's progress as it runs backwards. We used to enjoy more relaxed and balanced lives with a more relaxed lifestyle, more free time, greater commitment to a family, friends, greater social equality, fraternity, more civility to strangers, less stress and depression, less dependence on alcohol and drugs, and less addiction to money and power. We are now conscious of ourselves and as an individuality, but many of us are terrified about the new freedom. We worry far more, desperately seeking an illusion of security, which despite our increasingly frantic striving recedes far further from us. Life today divides into tasks. Life today divides into a fast track or a slow track. Both are less agreeable than a broad track of yesteryear. For the many of the slow track means economic insecurity, low earnings, low social standing, anxiety about unemployment, and missing out on the increasing material delights enjoyed for those who are on the fast track. But the fast track is not for the hazards. It's not without its own hazards. For the many mean of the single-minded obsession with getting ahead, total commitment to the job and expansion of personal development and personal relationships, and a frenzied lifestyle where work takes precedence over every death, everything else. Fast track is too and brings anxiety and poverty, through it's the case of poverty of time and love rather than money. In this analysis, the material advantages the personal disadvantages, and the modern life strikes a chord. I've got great news. If we accept the modern life as material, scientific, and technological level, but often screws up our personal lives, I can announce that there's a novel way out of this box. I'm referring to the 80-20 principle. The 80-20 principle. Observation that roughly 80% of the results stem from 20% fewer of causes. Later in this chapter, I'll explain how the principle works and give many fresh examples for the moment. Let me just say that this, whereas 80-20 principle has been used successfully in business and economics has driven progress throughout the modern world, has not yet been applied on anything like a same scale as lives of individuals. If it were so applied, we would enjoy life much more, work less, and achieve more. In reality, the best way to achieve more is to do less. Less is more when we concentrate on a few things that are truly important, not at least from which happens to ourselves and our loved ones. What is this life? if full of care. We have no time to stand and stare. William Henry Davies. I'll explain how we are and why we are using the 80-20 principle and it can cause fundamental change in the way we approach life in chapters 2 and 3. But I mustn't read ahead of myself and I mustn't go ahead of myself first to let me introduce you properly to the 80-20 principle, one of the most mind-blowing, far-reaching and surprising discoveries of over the past 200 years. If we took 100 people and divided them into a stem of 80 and a team of 20, we'd expect the team of 80 to achieve four times as much. And if we randomly selected the people, something like that would probably happen. Yet imagine a wonka world, a wonky world where 20 people achieve more results than the other 80. Make the wonky world even stranger. Imagine that not only do the 20% 20 20 people or the 20 people achieve more than the 80, they achieve four times more. This is exactly the wrong way around. We would expect the 80 people to achieve way more and four times more than the team of 20. Now this is what's so curious and lopsided in the world we imagine in the reverse. That 20 people somehow managed to get four times the results of the other 80. Impossible, unlikely, surely wonky world through not totally unthinkable must be very rare. What if one day we discovered that far from being unusual, the wonky world was actually typical and that the world routinely divides into few very powerful influences and the mass of totally unimportant ones when it turned out our whole view of life upside down? This is what happens when we discover the 80-20 principle. We find that 20% of people's natural forces, economical inputs, and other causes we can measure typically lead to about 80% of the results, outputs, and the effects. 
counting the top cities in England, I found that the largest 53 cities had 25,793,036 people living in them, and the next largest 210 cities of the towns had 6,539,772. This is a terrifying, terrifyingly precise. This is terrifyingly precise. An 80-20 relationship. 20.2% of the cities have 79.8% of the people. It's worth spelling out in the calculation. 53 out of 263 cities equal 20.2%. 25,793,036 out of 32,332,808 people equals 79.8. The power of the 80-20 principle lies in the fact that it is a counterintuitive. It's not what people expect. It's We seem to be programmed, perhaps by our liberal culture or our innate sense of fairness, to expect the picture to show in the figure, where causes the results balance roughly equally. Causes. Half a pie chart, half on half, each side equal. Causes equal, equal, half on half, and each side equal results. We do not get equal results from causes and res to the results. From causes to the results. Figure one, causes and results of what we expect. Instead, what we get is something totally different, more like figure two, where there is an 80% of your causes and a 20% factor of the results. Figure two, causes and results of what really happens. Here's some il other illustrations. Five people sit down to play poker. It's likely that one of them is 20% and they will walk away with at least 80% of the stakes. In any large retail store, 20% of the sales staff will have more than 80% of the dollar value of sales. Studies consistently show that 20% of the customers lead more than 80% of the profits for any particular firm. For example, a Toronto-based Royal Bank in Canada recently worked out how much profit each of the customers provided. It was staggering to learn that 70% of our customers yielded 93% of the profits. Fewer than 20% of the media stars hog more than 80% of the limelight, and more than 80% of the books sold come from 20% of the authors. More than 80% of a scientific breakthrough comes from fewer than 20% of scientists in every age. It is celebrated fewer scientists who make the vast majority of discoveries. Crime statistics repeatedly show that 20% of thieves make off with 80% of the loot. Who gets the most dates in speed dating? With the latest craze for a single people in New York and London thought that it had fizzled out the time you read this is a speed dating. It worked like this. Put around 24 people in a room, 20 to 40 people in a room. The women sit down at tables and men above the seat to a seat. Each couple has between 3 or 5 minutes to talk before the man moves to the next woman. Everyone has a unique number and a, and a badge and you can make a note of the number of anyone that you'd like to go on a proper date with. The organizers collect the notes and at the end of the evening match up the pairs who liked each other. The next day the emails and matches with names and contact details. A major speed dating operator in U.S. confirms that most dating a relative few participants, at least 75% of their interested, goes out without 25% of the people. He, comp he comments, naturally they tend to be the most attractive people, but it's true that about half the guys do well have been speed dating before and they were so confident about it. It seems to get a large uh, number of dates and it's a good idea to attend at least two or three speed dating events. Note that the 80-20 is simply shorthand for a very lopsided relationship between causes and results. The numbers don't have to add up to 100% in some cases, 30% of the causes, 70% of the results. Other examples may show 70-20 relationship, 20% causes a lead to 70% of the results. Or split, it may be 80-10 or 90-10 or even 99-1. We have to find an even more exaggerating picture of the 80-20, whereas fewer 20% of people causes, in some cases, as little as 1% or less, lead to 80% of the results. Here are some very wonky cases. Betfair. Betfair, the world's leading betting exchange, where individuals take bets for other individuals, saying that 90% of the money stakes come to 10% of its clients. In Indonesia 1985, Chinese residents compromise less than 3% of the population but own 70% of the wealth. Similarity, the Chinese of the third Malaysia population yet own 90% of, of its wealth, and Meredith's French families make up 50% of the population, own 90% of the wealth. Out of 6,700 languages, 100 of the top 1.5% are used to 90% of the world's people. In a famous experiment, psychologist Stanley Milgram Dominantly and randomly selected, 160 citizens of Omaha, Nebraska, and asked them to package a Boston stockbroker, but not directly. Send a package to a Boston stockbroker, but not directly. They had to send a package to someone they knew personally. Then had to pass it to another person contact that they thought might know someone who knew someone close to the stockbroker, and so on. Most of the packages reached the stockbroker within six steps, leading to the idea that six degrees of separation. But the point for us is that... More than half of the packages that made it to the stockbroker came through only three well-connected individuals in Boston. Those three people were important in getting desired results than the other inhabitants of Boston. Epidemics are caused by tiny proportions 
of causes which then have the effect of the proportion to their numbers. For instance, in an outbreak of gonorrhea in Colorado Springs, neighborhoods compromising with 6% of the city's population accounted for 50% of the cases. Investigating revealed that 168 people who had met six bars caused whole epidemic. Less than 1% of the population of Colorado Springs was therefore responsible for 100% of the disease. Americans compromise less than 5% of the world's population yet consume 50% of its cocaine. Much more than 80% of the wealth created by a new business comes from fewer than 20% of the people who start them. Probably only 1% of new ventures in the past 30 years included Microsoft, which is worth $200 billion, account for 80% of the value created. Similarly, 1% of entrepreneurs, notably Bill Gates, is worth more than $30 million make more than 80% of the money from new enterprises. Historical files reveal that police spies in Europe were always aware of several thousand professional revolutionaries between 1847 and 1917. Of professional revolutionaries between 1847 and 1917. Yet only one of them, Vladimir Ich Yulinov, who called himself Lenin, actually caused a lasting revolution. Thus, one revolutionary out of more than 3,000 or 0.03% of the revolutionaries participated 100% of successful revolutions between those dates. Though this is an extreme example, history is full of cases where tiny minor m minority of players have diversified it, its whole course. To be sure, the 20% or fewer people who cause 80% or more of the results, whether good or bad, is randomly selected. They are not typical. They are interesting because they produce results from 10 to 20 times greater than those produced by other people. As the high performers are not 10 to 20 times percent more intelligent than the other people, it is the methods resource that they use, unusual of the power, all of life. 80-20 principle applies not only to groups of people, but their behavior, but to virtually every aspect of life. There's always a small minority of very powerful forces and a great mass of unimportant ones. For instance, 20% of the countries containing far fewer than 20% of the world's population consume 70% of its energy, 75% of its metals, and 85% of its timber. Far less than 20% of Earth's surface produces 80% of its minerals. Wealth. Fewer than 20% of the species cause more than 80% of ecological degradation. It's estimated that just one species, one out of 30 million on Earth, that's point zero 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 three percent cause 40% of harm. No prize for guessing the species. A very small percentage of meteorites falling to Earth produce more than 80% of the damage. Far fewer than 20% of war produces 80% of the casualties. An overwhelming majority of baby seals in Alaska die young. 80% of the survivors come from 20% of the mothers. Wherever you go, fewer than 20% of the clouds will be producing 80% of the rain. Less than 20% of the record music is played more than 80% of the time. And if you go to a concert, whether it's rock or classical or old familiar pieces, a tiny portion of the total repertoire available will be churned out time and time and again. Fewer than 20% of the treasures in most museums' inventories are displayed more than 80% of the time. Of investments made by successful ventures, capitalists, 5% of them provide 55% of the cash, 10% produce 73%, and 15% yield a total of 82%. Fewer than 20% of inventions have more than 80% of impact on our lives. In the 20th century, nuclear power and computer probably had a greater influence than hundreds of thousands of other inventions, new technologies. More than 80% of food comes from far less than 20% of land. Also, fruit typically accounted for much less than 20% of the massive weight of every tree and vine that meat is reduction of vast amounts of digested grain and grass. Drinks are also an extreme demonstration of 80-20% principle, which makes Coca-Cola so much more valuable than any other soft drink on the planet. Sacred formula in tiny amounts concentrated mixed at large volumes of water produces Coke, in which much produces beer and makes different new beer brands distinctive, minute proportions of hops and other flavorings. In fact, the whole process of life, from made corn to giant oak, from grain to wheat, from bread bowl region to to perfect expression of the 80-20 principle, take it to the fullest extent, diminutive cause, massive results. Finally, evolution presents a stunning example of selectivity. 1% of species that have ever lived on Earth, biologically, Richard Dawson estimates constitutes 1%, 100% of the species now living. Finally, an evolution presents a stunning example of selectivity. 1% of species that have ever lived on Earth, biologist, biologist Richard Dawkins estimates, constitutes 100% of species now living. The 80-20 principle works everywhere in life. I'm surprising it's amazing. It's not what we expect, but there's a big imbalance between causes and results. Most causes have little result. A few transform life. Many people believe that the 80-20 principle, with its emphasis on this 20%, is inherently in litist elitist but it's very wrong it's fallacy and there's a restriction on who's the 80 20 percent principle or the zero sum again it's not true because i benefit from the principle somebody else must lose to object to the improvement on the grounds of its elitist of elitist elitist is a wrongfully headed progress and desirably and helps everyone perfection and quality and equality impossible in my opinion equal, equally undesirable 
undesirable. The 80-20% principle is no more elitist than, for example, money or private property or vaccines against disease. Refusing to use any of these because they are elitist is silly. They are all tools that improve life for everybody. Anybody can improve their life by using the 80-20 way. The application of the 80-20 principle to our daily lives with the objective to decreasing effort and worry, increasing happiness and results from what we want. We use the 80-20 way to get what the grain of the universe, producing better results for easily and what we do and when we do, other people benefit as well. What you happen if it, what would happen if everybody used eighty twenty way? Everybody would be better off. There would still be top twenty percent at the bottom, eighty twenty percent of everything. Certainly, unless there was no further improvement, would be impossible. Certainly, unless there was no further improvement, would be possible. Only if I reach utopia or nirvana, a perfect world with eighty twenty percent stop working. Fortunately, that that's not going to happen. We are always have something to improve. And as you know, my own experience, as hundreds of thousands of people have discovered, using the eighty twenty principle can have an enormous influence on just our economy and society, but also our personal lives. It can make us happy, fulfilled, and relaxed. We start by creating more with less. Create more with less. Many might go to heaven with half the labor they go to hell. Ben Johnson. All human history, all progress and civilization involves getting more with less. Nearly 8,000 years ago, humans moved from hunting savage animals to gathering wild fruits to a system of agriculture, cultivating land and domesticating animals. Our ancestors got much, much more better food and much less struggle and danger. Until 300 years ago, 90% of the world's population labored on the land. Then a new agriculture revolution used machinery to transform productivity. Today, the developed country's agriculture employs 2-3% to of the workforce yet produces vastly more food which is also varied in nutrients and nutrition. That's more with less. The highway of economic progress is the past 400 years has also been more with less. Identifying few productive forces and methods, the 20 percent, and multiplying them with more results that can be obtained with fewer sources, fewer resources. Smaller and smaller amounts of land, capital labor, management materials, in time have been used to generate larger and better outputs, more steel for less iron ore, capital and labor, more better cars for less energy costs, more consumer goods for every type, with more features, higher quality, even lower prices. A century ago, computers didn't exist. Just 40 years ago, a few massive clunky computers were made to an enormous effort and cost. The planet's total computer power was far less than that of a small laptop I'm using now. Computers keep getting cheaper, smaller, easier, use, and more powerful. They exemplify more with less and exemplify more with less. Every material advance of humanity in science, technology, and living standards of housing, food, and health, and long-term, and leisure, and transportation, everything that makes modern life so much richer and more fun than before, gives more with less. We can often get more with less simply by leaving something out. All algebra does this. It lets us compute more easily by leaving out the numbers. With the basis of computer programming breakthroughs, the World Wide Web operates to take in distance of locating of an equation. The Sony Walkman, a brilliant innovation and really cassette player, minus the amplifier and the speakers. Yet it creates a fantastically versatile way to listen to music anywhere. A dry martini makes a great drink of cutting out the martini. The best fast food industry is simply restaurants without the waiters. It is a scan exaggeration to say how the less is the basic principle by which the modern science, technology, and business advance living standards everywhere. The 80-20 the principle says that the small minority of causes leads to large majority of results. And we know that the results we want, therefore, we can look up the super productivity way to get those results. The 80-20% principle guarantees that there is always a way, every time more with less possible provided, but we identify the golden 20%, the people methods and the resources for extremely creative and productivity. Companies and countries that devised ways to deliver more value and less effort, people power and money flourish, where money will flourish, but it can never rest on their laurels, because there is always a way to deliver even more for even less, and somebody soon will find it, because the 80-20 principle economic progress cannot stop. We don't apply more with less to our individual lives, though. Though the modern world has embraced the law of progress, the economic and scientific principle is more with less. It has consistently failed to apply very same principles in which we organize our private and social lives. The modern principle for individuals is more with more. To get the money or more money, more status, more interesting job, and exciting life, it seems it necessary to give more and more of one's profession job. Company, a customer, sometimes the point is that there is no time and energy left for oneself, one's family, one's friends, let alone for unhealthy relaxation or to recharge creative batteries. Life is the fastest lane and work in the fastest lane. There's certainly more challenge, more stimulation, and more money. But there's also total submission to work demands, more burnout, and persuasive ang and pervasive anxiety. How come we successfully use more with less for science, technology, and business, and yet insist on more and more when it comes to our working lives? If more with less works with companies and economies, it should work with individuals as well. In fact, I know it does from personal experience and from seeing my friends and acquaintances getting more with less and satisfaction, more achievement, more money, more happiness, better relationships and more balance than a relaxed life from less blood, toil, tears and sweat. 
Many things from which we do absorb energy is the worst and useless. Worry is a prime example. Worry is never useful. When will we find ourselves worrying? We never either act or not worry. The decide is not to act and not to worry. If you want to act in bad fate and reduce its chance of happening, the action is worthwhile. When should we act and not worry? If on the other hand we can't control the influence that will happen, then worrying will cause us to distress, but not help us. We should not act and not worry. Worries will always arise, but what could we do? And when we can do it, do without them. Instantly decide to act or not to act. But in either case, not to worry. Have a big project ahead of nothing of us. Have a big project ahead of us. Nothing less than the reversal modern work and living habits to exchange from more with more to more with less in our personal, social, and professional lives. It will take time. Social fashions don't change all that easily or quickly. But the Calvinist notion of the toil and trouble of essential from personal advancement is so deeply rooted in the culture of working assumptions of modern life that it will take a generation to uproot it. Yet a beauty of 80-20% way for an individual, for you and for me, is the way we do it and the way we have to have it. It's the how, it's, and it's all the ways that in which we have to wait. We can start using it and benefit right away. How to get more happiness with less effort. More with less is practical to and delivers two promises. It will always, always possible to improve anything in our lives, not by small amounts, but by large amounts. How to get more happiness with less effort. More with less is practical tool that delivers two promises. The way to make improvement is to ask, what will give me much better results for much less energy? It's not enough to seek improvement by means of greater effort in the same effort as today. Bet's better outcasts to be sought alongside lower effort. To expect more with less is to seem unreasonable, but precisely the reason of amazing improvement is possible. To trap in making an effort to improve the things that we continue making the same kind of effort, may we improve things from which a minor improvement sooner or later will exhaust ourselves in the process instead. We should be playing in the making that are starting demands of more with less. We are going to have to dream it up and break through, and deliberately cutting back on what we put into the task and yet asking for much more, we force ourselves to think hard and do something different. This is the root of all progress. Thinking hard may sound a bit frightening, but it isn't much to do a little hard thinking, arrive at much better a result, avoid a lot of hard doing. But with, with practice, thinking how to get more with less becomes fun. The trick is to pick activities offering a high reward for less energy. You have the high and then the low amount. And in the center between the top and bottom is a line called effort. And then you have the left and the right side, which is low and high. And that's the reward. You want to get the most highest reward with the lowest effort. Figure three, the more and less chart. Imagine you're a cave person, a cave person in the town of Bedrock. Now the town of Flintstones, you need to get the other side of the town in a hurry and the alteration is to walk or run. Walking will take forever, running is quicker, but more effort. The run would be, the run would make a very modern blunder of seeking more with more in the classy trap of trying to secure a better result for working harder. They need 20% ways different. We demand quite unreasonably a much better result with much less effort. For since we know more with less is possible, we continue thinking until we get more or less solution. And we get more bedrock much faster without doing the slog of running. Like the waitress in the prehistoric diner, we could roller skate with less energy than it would take to run, yet arrive quicker. Or we can go on one step further and jump on the back in friendly brontosaurus. That's more with less. And imagine that you're a teenager wanting a date with an attractive boy or girl, and the more with less chart could look like figure four. Draw, you have the high and low effort of the square, where you draw attention to yourself, or you think about it and do nothing. And then the left and right, which is low and high, of the reward. You got the effort and reward, where you win over parents, and you smile and ask. You want to be at the point where you're very high with reward and low with effort. Most attractive, more with less. I am not saying that you should take a path of least resistance or never dedicate yourself 100% to an activity or cause or dearest. The choice is yours. If we go for the right activities, we can work effortlessly and achieve a great deal. If what we put everything into is what we do and achieve even more. Figure 4, Teenagers Winning the Day. Think about any great scientist, musician, artist, thinker, philanthropist, or business leader. Do they achieve by trying to do something and find easy and natural by trying to do something that is hard and unnatural? Do they achieve because they work hard or because they find it easier than other people to excel in their chosen arena? Do they work hard because they feel guilty or because they identify their work and believe in it and love it? Even when they work hard, their work is always economical. They get a huge return on their efforts. In our personal life, there's always the thing that we can do and work very best well, taking little money or effort. It's incredibly corny, but the best things in life are free, or nearly free, giving a fantastic return on effort. Saying thanks, showing appreciation, displaying affection, watching a sunrise, sunset, caring for a pet or a plant, smiling a casual acquaintance or stranger, committing random acts of kindness, enjoying walk in the beautiful place. 
These are all things of getting more with less. The rewards are out proportioned to the effort. If you think about it, the only way to get leaps forward in our lives is to man more with less. The beauty of more with less is that you can be applied for anything. It always works. It always gives you the answer of what you keep looking throughout your life. The problem with, with the more the problem with more with more is is that it's unsustainable. People more less easy maintain and extend a bit of upfronting thinking in a small price for a huge lifetime reward. What's difficult becomes easy. One final element. One final element of more with less that can take and make a difference of our own lives and the role as the habit plays. Anything we do is more difficult the first time and gets progressively easier, but the more we do it, the point that becomes easier to not do it than to not do it. A terrific example of an exercise. Walking five miles is extremely tough through the first time you do it, but if you do it every day, nothing could be easier. In fact, both body and mind get used to doing it after about two weeks. It becomes like second nature. What's difficult becomes easy, and what's easy often creates difficulties. Although you can change your habits at any time, it's easier to change earlier in life. We almost do what's easy, such as overeating, driving everywhere rather than walking, getting angry, or at least provocative. We'll find it difficult to reverse the habit a few years later. On the other hand, if we do a few hugely worthwhile things that are hard to start with, we'll find before that long that they become easy. In a few great habits, the vital becomes the without continuous renewal and we can lose without working very hard for it. It doesn't matter, for example, efforts will be gone. Why work hard for nothing when a few habits that become nature, second nature, can give you a healthy rhythm every day? We get more rewards with less energy if we adopt rewards habits earlier in earlier than later. But also given human nature, we'd be better selective about the good habits from which we're going to adopt. We get more happiness from less effort if we carefully select a few excellent habits we'd like to have and master these. Not bothering about all the other good habits we could in the theory to cultivate, there's a limited number of good habits most of us can practice. A few habits have phenomenal effect on our happiness throughout life. We get massive bonanza from a little upfront effort. If for you not to me to decide to high pay off new habits and cultivate now, you'll lose on the leaving until later. You shouldn't choose the habit because it's a morally good one, but because a huge benefit to you. Choose it several super rewarding habits that will be your friends for life. A habit that's your friend. Everleaf and Overleaf are some examples of habits that are huge benefits and the benefit mattering to you. Only you can judge. Choose your seven high pay off habits carefully. Get more happiness for less effort. Examples of high lifetime pay off habits. Examples of high lifetime payoff habits. Habits. Daily exercise. The payoff is you much the much better health, more attractive body, you feel great. Habit. Daily intellectual. You keep alert, increase your intelligence, and enjoy thinking. Habits. Doing a truistic. Payoff is it makes you happy. Habit is you act a day. Doing an altruistic act a day is what makes you happy. Meditating or quiet thinking each day. It clears your mental clutter from a better for better decisions. Daily nurturing of your lover. It keeps him or her and them happy. Always give praise or thanks where possible. Makes the other person feel good. Save and invest 10% of the income. Future free of money worries. Being generous to friends. It deepens the relationship and feels good. Always having two or three hours of pure relaxation every day. It renews your energy. It keeps you happy and healthy. Keeping calm and relaxing always. Evokes trust. Focusing on what matters to you. Deciding never to worry. Always to act and not to worry. Not to act and not to habitually asking yourself how to get more with less. It evokes trust, enhances reputations to feel good and better health and longer life. You make more out with less. You get peace of mind, reduction of effort, and dramatic improvement to any situation. Pick a few payoff habits that will make you the happiest. List the far exhaustive so that adds to the habits and have potential to make you very happy. Then master your seven. More with less. The final frontier. What's more precious to us is short supply will be the most upset to see run out. The answer is probably time. We might be unbelievable more with the less supplies with which to think of the shortest of all time. Time yet, however strange it seems, that claims is true. Chapter 3. We have all the time in the world. Time is a gentle god. Sophocles. At the age 30, an extremely successful Wall Street trader decided to go to Tibet, enter a mon monastery, and undertake rigorous spiritual studies. On his first day, while his fellows trained him in hanging on the back, the ex-trader marched up to the top Zen master and asked, How long does it normally take to become enlightened? Seven years later, the Zen master replied, But I was at the top of my class at Harvard Business School. I made ten million in gold in Goldman Sachs, in preparation for the entering of the monastery, I've taken all the best time management courses. How long will it take for me to study intensively and try to extreme, extremely hard to cut the time? The Zen master smiled and said, 14 years. 
On the other hand, do you remember the story about Alchemides? He was having a quiet bath one day, slopped over some water on the side, then suddenly leapt into light from his tub naked through the main street of Athens, shouting at the top of his lungs, Eureka, I've got it! He discovered the important theory. It took just a moment of inspiration while he was relaxing, thinking about nothing much. Time is like that. Cussed when we try to speed it up, dear friend, when we slow down. What's this got to do with the 80-20 principle? Time is perhaps the best example of the principle and the one of the most values to our lives. If we create high-value work, we'll achieve at least 80% of it, 20% of our time. In our personal lives, we've attained 80% of our happiness and value to, the, to those who we love 20% or less of our time. So again, if we create high-value at work, we'll achieve at least 80% of it in 20% of the time. In our personal lives, we'll attain 80% of our happiness and value to those we love in 20% or less of our time. Once we realize this, our lives are transformed. Suddenly, there's no shortage of time. There's no rush. If we think intelligently about what we can achieve with our time, we can be relaxed, even lazy, in fact. Being lazy, having plenty of time to think, may actually be a precondition for achieving a great deal. This is what's true about the ancient Greeks. With slaves to do all the work, they spend all the time thinking, debating, and leisure pursuits results the greatest civilization, science, and literature that ever existed. It's also true of developed modern society. Because most of us don't have the labor of our hands, we use our minds to create great wealth, science, and culture. Yet here is a paradox. We've never before seen such been so free, yet failed to realize the extent of our freedom. We've never had so much time, yet felt we had so little. Modern life bullies us to speed up our lives. We use technology to do everything faster, but in a racing against the clock, all we do is stress ourselves out. Going faster doesn't give us more time. It makes us feel like we're always behind. We battle against time and an imagined enemy. We perceive time as an accelerating draining out from our lives as it's an alarming at an alarming rate. Andrew Marvel wrote, but at my back, I will always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. Henston Austin Dobson weary observed, Time goes and you say, ah, no, alas, time stays, and then we go. However, Marvel, Dobson, Modern Life are wrong, are all wrong. However, Marvel, Dobson, and Modern Life are all wrong. We can have more with less, more happiness with less time, more results with less time. The 80-20 way overturns the modern view of time, freeing us to enjoy our lives without worrying about time. Time is not shortly supplied. We are awash with it. Time need not rush, need need nor need we. Time can still stand bringing us happiness, achievement, and a taste of eternity. Time is a boundless sea. We could swim happily in time, confidently, calmly, with no sense of impending doom. Dear old Sophocle, dear old Sophocles was right after all. Time is a gentle God. There are two ways in which we experience time. There's the small quantity of time, the 20% or less, and then that delivers 80% of what we want. And then there's much larger quantities of time, the 80% or more, that delivers the miserable 20%. Time doesn't run a constant rate. Time flows and fits, starts its gurgles and splurges and trickles and floods. There's a long period of nothing happens and short bursts when tidal waves transform our world. The art of time surfing is to track down the waves and ride them to happiness and success. Time is not absolute. Time is relative to our emotions, our attention, and our timing. There are times when we're totally absorbed, absolutely happy, in the tune with our universe. When time stands still, we are scarcely conscious of time ourselves. We are in the zone of, in the moment, experience a sense of inner calm or bliss. Time flew by we say the day just disappeared these are the rare moments we find and feel the happiest from when we achieve the most a little like Archimedes we have to break through the inside of idea you may make a decision that changes lives these small fragments of time are worth many days weeks months and years of normal time a time that actually changes your life at other times little worthwhile happens we're bored miserable exciting in these though in these dog days time doesn't race past and stand still it drags heavily along in time from the first category, the same as the character value of time of the second category. Hardly a day is the time of zone which may be worth a lifetime of dog days. Less is more. The value of time, how we experience it, depends on how we use it, how we feel about our lives at the time. Bullet point one. We are more likely to experience 80% of our happiness and 20% of our time. 80% of our time may only contribute 2% of our happiness. Probably 80% of what we achieve comes from 20% of our time. And other 80% of our time only leads to 20% of our achievement. It follows that bullet point. Most of what we do is limited value for us and everyone else. French novelist Le Boyard wrote, 
Those who make the worst use of time most complain of its shortness. A few things we experience and do in very little time are an enormous value. We get a fantastic return on when 20% of our time leads to 80% of our happiness and achievement. We could get a fourfold of 400% return on this time. If only we make good use of short portions of our time. There can't be any great shortage of it. And 80% of our time leads to 20% of our value. That's the return of the time of 20 divided in by 80, a 25%. The issue is not time, but what we do with it. We can get a paltry, a 25% return on our time of 400%. If you are self-employed and spend two days a week on your most valuable type of activity, you should be able to get 160% of the value using to take five days to generate and still have three days left over for whatever you want. We can sharply boost the quality of our lives by changing the use of our time. If we do more few things, make us happiness and productive, the much less of our many activities takes us to our times but don't lead to high levels of happiness and achievement. We can improve our lives in a sensational way, all with less effort. We normally experience good times, which is short, and bad times, which is long. What if, what if we stitch them together and we make good times long and bad times short that revolutionized our lives? We revolutionized our, li revolutionized our lives. Of course, happiness and personal effectiveness can't be measured precisely. The 80-20 numbers are approximate. Still, multiplying the value of our time by 4. A good rule of thumb is like dividing by 320 instead of 80 without any of the disadvantages of old age. What are your happiness islands? Happiness islands are the small dollops of time, the special glorious times when you were the happiest. Think back to the last time you were really happy when the times before that. What did these times, some of them, have in common? Were you a special place, particular person with a certain someone pursuing similar sort of activity? Are you some common themes? Was there a theme going on? How can you multiply your time spent in Happiness Island if you figure out your Happiness Island makes up 20% of your time? How could you take that 40, 60, and 80%? If 80% of your time leads to 20% of your happiness, you can cut those activities freeing up time to make things to make you happy. Luckily, there are always many activities to give you a poor return of happiness for lifetime spent. Survey of people watching television, for example. Show the few of them which are happy after watching hours and hours of TV. Typically, they feel mildly depressed. If watching television makes you happy, do more of it. But otherwise, stop. What are the things that have poor happiness returns could quit? Could you quit doing? What do you do outside of your sense of duty? There's little pleasure of duty how much you're doing. But if you were happy and happiness should over and would overflow into your lives of those around you, time spent being miserable is antisocial. Ask yourself, if most of my time doesn't make me happy, how can I spend less time on these activities? What are your achievement islands? When you first hear about the 80-20 principle, many of you get on the wrong end of the stick. The idea is all very well in theory. The head of the charity told me recently, but I haven't been able to make up the work in practice. I can't confine myself to the top 20% of what I do. Real life allows this kind of place or pace to be maintained for long. Real life doesn't allow that kind of pace to be maintained for long. What do you think about most valuable 20% is? What do you think your most valuable 20% is, I asked. Well, rushing around giving speeches, raising money, meeting a great and good, and doing great and good. I can do two lunches and two dinners a week where I make speeches, but any more than that and I get burnt out. But that's probably not your most valuable time, I countered. Think about the small amounts of time from which you have relaxed and yet achieved a great deal. Have you had any of those recently? Maybe you had a brilliant new idea. Oh, I see what you mean. There was an afternoon from which a beautiful, it was beautiful and I was worn out, so I went home and sat on a deck chair in a garden. I was goofing off, really. When I had the idea of our new campaign, it's true. We, write, we raised five times more from the campaign than any other we had to go. Achievement islands are the small time periods from which you did your most productive or creative when you thought more with less, accomplished most with little apparent effort in very little time. What's your achievement island where you, where you produce more with less? Do you have things in common? Do they have to do with the same time of the day, activities similar such as selling, writing, making decisions? Do they happen to be in a special place, particular colleagues after the same events of stimulation? What was your mood like when you were in it? In the group of, were you alone? Were you in a group, rushed? Were you relaxed, talking, listening, or thinking? How could you multiply time on your achievement islands and reduce time on everything else? Richard Adams was bored, disillusional, middle-level bureaucrat. When he was 50, he dreamt up a bedtime story of his daughter, Juliet, who loved rabbits. Water shipped down, sold over 7 million copies, transformed Adams' life. Could you spend more time on the things you enjoy, even by quitting your day job? Could you be a hobby interest sideline for the life blossom to a new career. Find out. Spend more time on the things you enjoy. Try your new projects while you're still working at your normal job. Experiment. Experiment with different ideas until one clicks. The poor daydreaming clerk. 
Once there was a wayward school kid expelled from being disruptive, he found a badly paid job at junior cler clerical office, and he became a junior clerical officer. He was so bored with work he found plenty of time by daydreaming and reading, but science, he, fan he fancied himself as a self-taught amateur scientist. The kid was Albert Einstein. He was in his mid-twenties, and he rocked the scientific world with the theory of relativity. He seussed, and while the Swiss of patient Athens and burned in the previous four years, he relished the rest of his life first as a celebrity scientist. Many great ideas have come from the people doing ordinary jobs. Time in the world otherwise would be wasted on misery. Miserable can be hugely creative and enjoyable. Many great ideas have come from people doing ordinary jobs. Time that would otherwise be wasted and miserable can become hugely creative and enjoyable. Think about the 80-20 question overleaf. To answer them, try thinking about writing down everything that really excites you. What you love doing in any part of life, at work, your hobbies, sports, the best minutes of each day. Then, either choose these activities and make a central part of your life, or work out these activities and have it in common to do more of that and less of everything else. For example, my life took a turn for the better when I realized what I loved doing was evoking enthusiasm. I loved evoking enthusiasm, getting an individual or more often a group, all the people up in a topic and cause myself felt strongly for a cause I felt strongly about. That is why I spend most of my time writing books, giving speeches, talking to friends about ideas that excite us all. There's no standard job category for evoking enthusiasm, and yet the insight that is that I enjoy the most and do it well is I led by a fuller and richer life while also doing less. I now have a simple decision, a decision rule. My decision rule is if I'm asked to do something and it doesn't evolve or evoke enthusiasm, I say no. What's the equivalent for you? 80-20 questions. Could I enjoy life more by developing a personal interest or an obsession that drives me? Might it lead to a new career? 80-20 questions. Could I take the part of my life that most excites me and make a career out of it? 80-20 questions. Which question could I ask myself to jumpstart my inspiration? Down with time management. Up with time revolution. Don't try to manage your time. You try to manage something if you're short, in it, if you're short of it. You try to manage something, and if you're short of it, money, for an example, and we're not short of time, but we are not short of time. But you may be short of ideas, confidence, common sense, but not time. We are short of those marvelous times when time stands still, when we are wonderfully happy and creative. Time management tells us to speed up. It promises us more time, how to free more time, time to relax, but it doesn't deliver. The promise is just a carrot to make you move faster. Like the donkey, we find ourselves moving faster, but remain those few elusive inches away from the carrot. In today's faster world, hours are longer, work less leisurely, and pressures are more intense. Like the donkeys, we all have been conned with the time management. We work more and relax less. Time Revolution says the opposite. We have too much time, not too little. We have too much time. It is because we have so much time that we squander it. To detonate your time revolution, time down. Stop worrying. Do fewer things. Chuck your to-do list. Make a not-to-do list. Act less. Think more. Act less. Think more. Reflect on what really matters to you. Stop doing anything that isn't valuable, that doesn't make you happy. Savor life. The modern world has accelerated out of control. Technology meant to add to our free time, but it's done in the opposite. As Theodore Zeldin says, Technology has been a rapid heartbeat, compressing housework, travel, entertainment, squeezing more and more into the allotted span. Nobody expected that it would create the feeling that life moves too fast. Swim against the tide of acceleration. Be unconventional, even eccentric. Purge your diary. Dump your cell phone. Stop going to meetings or events that bore you. Reclaim time for yourself and the people who you care about. Time revolutionaries. Like many, I admire Warren Buffett, the investor who's a planet's second richest person. I don't admire him for his business acumen or his money, but his wildly unconventional way with time. He runs America's biggest, richest, conglomerate empire. But what does he do? Does he rush around? He is super busy, is he? Absolutely not. He says he tap dances to work. Once there, he expects to lie on his back and paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling. His style, he says, borders on theology. He makes me very few decisions. He makes very few decisions, only the extremely important ones. By being relaxed and thoughtful, he usually gets them right. Of people I've known, he gets my number one time revolutionary award. Step forward, Bill Bain, the founder and former leader of a very successful management consulting firm. Bill Bain. I was a partner for two years. Everyone liked, worked hard, and 
long, with one expectation. I'd often run into Bill in the elevator. He was always dressed immaculately, always entered and leaving the office off in spotless, spotless tennis gear. Bill made all the key decisions and made a fortune with very little time and effort. Managing consulting a hard labor, yet Jim, a friend of the partner, also bucked the trend. We first worked together in a tiny cramped office, full of noise and frenzied activity. Everyone dashed madly around except Jim. There he sat, calmly examining his calendar and languidly writing down his objectives. Our job was to execute them. Jim was wonderfully effective. Chris was another consultant, a time revolutionary. He sold multi-million dollar assignments. The troops loved him. He was always in the office early in the morning, late at night. His reputation for long hours was undeserved. Chris routinely spent afternoons discreetly playing golf and tennis, race track, taking long lunches. Everyone assumed that he was with his clients. When I was when I chided him, he said he was following the 80-20 way, getting more results with much less energy. I had to agree it was true. Living and live in the present. The present moment is vital. The present moment is vital. Don't live in the past or the future. Don't worry about the past or the future. Get more with less. Confine yourself to the present moment and enjoy concentrating on the present moment. Time doesn't run out, nor does it run from left to right. As the clock tells, time keeps coming on, keeps coming round. Time enjoyed is the past still there. Our achievements and good deeds still stand. The present real or precious regardless of how long or short the future will be. We can be proud of our past, but we can also have hope for the future. But we can only live in the present. The 80-20 rule of views the time makes us more relaxed and connected. Relax because time gone is not time used up. We are more connected to what is going on now and to other people. We have the precious gift of life today to be enjoyed and experienced how we choose. Each moment life is a quality of eternal to stamp our own individuality. When time stands still, we are totally absorbed in the present. We are everything and we are nothing. Time is fleeting and eternal. We are happy. Life has meaning. We're part of time and also outside of it. Time revolution brings us more joy in time. When the present moment has meaning, time is one seamless whole, valuable, yet inconspicuous. The rush is over. Anxieties recede. Bliss increases. We could be intensely happy in no time. When we are all in one life in the universe, we step outside of time. We reach the highest form of more with less. Improving key elements of your life. It's time to move to part two, from which we apply less is more and more with less to five key areas of your life. The... More, less is more and more with less key areas of yourself, areas of your work and success, areas of your money, areas of your relationship, and the areas to the simple good life. In each area, we learn to focus so that more and less is more. We focus so that less is more. We also see how improving your life, dodging the strain and stress opposed by the more from the more treadmill, learning to enjoy more with less. The emphasis throughout our practical action steps in part three, you, you and I will carry this to its final conclusion, developing a personal action plan, enabling us to thrive in the modern world while elegantly sidestepping in its wearisome woes. Part two, making a living and a life. Chapter four, focus on the best 20%. I've got more energy now than when I was younger because I know exactly what I want to do. Legendary ballet master George Balanchin. When I was 12, Steven Spielberg decided to be a movie director. Five years later, he visited Universal Studios. He ducked out of the standard tour, find a red, real movie being made. A 17-year-old buttonholed head of the Universal editorial department told him about his films he was going to make. Next day, Spielberg dressed up in a suit, loaded his dad's briefcase with two candy bars, a sandwich, marched boldly through the gate into the Universal Studios. He commanded a deserted trailer, writing Steven Spielberg, director on the door. He became a fixture on the lot, mixing with directors, producers, writers, editors, sucking in ideas, observing how real directors behaved. At age 20, Spielberg showed the Universal a small movie he made and won a seven-year contract to direct a television series. Later, of course, he made a string of hits, including E.T., one of the highest-grossing movies of all time. Spielberg was focused, focused on the secret of all power of power, the personal power, personal power, happiness, and success. Focus on doing less, being less. Focus makes less more. Few people focus, yet focus is easy. Focus expands an individuality, the essence of being human. Who are you? Who do you want to become? Life's greatest mystery in human character and uniqueness is we craft individuality. Other animals can't. We share 98% of our genes with chimpanzees, yet 2% variations makes all the difference. We're not totally subjects to our genes in creating stories, ideas, music, science, popular culture, and thinking and communicating. Humans do surprisingly things that our genes wouldn't. Our destiny lies in becoming individuals and creating a fulfilling of our fulfillment to our unique potential. We each evolve differently and unpredictably, and individuality implies differentiation. Becoming different requires editing, subtracting. 
focus. We become dissimilar by focusing on the distinctive and authentic parts. True. We're the blank slates. We're the blank slates. The blank slates. Our gender, our genes determine our appearance and what we have in a big say in our other matters. But as we grow up, our parents and families influence how we behave, think, and think of ourselves. Our teachers, friends, priests, bosses, mentors mold us. The ideas and norms of our society and groups from whom we hang out strongly sway us. Yet subtract all these influence and there's still something left, the precious, strange thing called our self, our unique identity, anatomy. However pronounced in the pressure on us, we have our own personality. Nobody else on the planet is the same. In a big or small way, we bound to influence the world, making it a different than it was it would be with you or without us making it a different way than it would be without us we become individuals through subtraction less is more we have the wonderful opportunity to let go of these bits of ourselves that are not authentic not really us the parts imposed by the background parents and environment the authentic self is a part of all the total self, yet it's a vital self. We all have specific gifts, unique imaginations, our little bit of genius, the sparks of life that's a wholly ours. When we focus ourselves, we give up doing what any many other people do, thinking what others think. Is this a loss of quantity? Yes, but not a quality. And quality, less is more. By narrowing our interests, we deepen the intensify our interests. By focusing on the best, unique attributes, we move individual we move as an individual, more human. We focus our power and singularity and our ability to enjoy life profoundly and uniquely. Developing individuality is a conscious process. It involves deciding who you are and who you are not, who you want to become and who you, want to, and who you should become and who you don't want to become. We become more distinctive individuals through deliberate decisions and actions, honing and increasing what is different and best about us. Focus and individuality makes life easier. Many people meander. Many people meander through life, muddling along without great hope of direction, but they think it's the easiest way because it is. There is a short changing themselves. They're short changing themselves. Many people meander through life, muddling along with a great hope of direction. A great hope of direction. They're short changing themselves. Developing one's authentic self is a vital and best part of your oneself. It's not difficult or unnatural. It's being true to yourself. You give up the parts from which you are not a genuine in and you're natural. You stop acting. You stop pretending to be interested or exciting in things that bore you. You stop worrying about the other people think about you. What could be easier, more rewarding than you could be electrifying yourself and electrifying your life for more? The modern world overloads us. We try to keep us in so many things. We make zillions of little decisions. It's way too much. How much simpler could we make a few big decisions? As Amy Harris Reary observes, nuns do not need to keep up with Vogue. We can't honestly and intensely about to make about too many people. We can't honestly care intensely about too many people or too many things. We can't be devoted to too many people or causes at once. Life is easily after making a few big decisions. Life is easier after making a few big decisions. Bullet one. Who and what do you care most about? What kind of person are you and want to become? What are your strongest qualities, emotions, and abilities? Do you want to commit to one life partner? Who? Do you want to raise children? Do you want to make a name for yourself? And for what? Do you want to work for yourself or on your own terms? At what? Do you want to create something that other people will notice and enjoy? What? Do you want to have a cottage small by a waterfall? What are you putting energy into that isn't essential for your happiness? All of these decisions exclude, they simplify life, close off options, eliminate excess choice. They concentrate energy. They are putting energy info. You are putting in energy into. These are the things you're putting your energy into. Is your personal power focused? When trying to answer questions like these, don't be afraid to ask good friends or mentors for help. Use these people as sounding boards. Most of them need assistance from others before we discover what is best for us. Whenever you believe you can do something or you believe you can't, you're right. Focus decreases doubt and turbocharges confidence and power. As Shakespeare wrote in the Measure for Measure, our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. William Shakespeare. We all have a tremendous underused under asset. Our subconscious mind and emotions. The subconscious is a friendly and truly personal computer. It's always switched on. It's always churning away. The subconscious can resolve dilemmas, breed brilliant new ideas, bring peace and joy. The subconscious mind is like a personal computer itself. The subconscious delivers much more with much less energy and cost. 
How many times have you been walking with a dog, brushing your teeth, meditating, sitting in a deck chair, when suddenly, wham, eureka, the conscious mind wasn't working on the issue, the subconscious was delivering the answer you needed. The subconscious is selected. You can care deeply about an issue and take notes. It doesn't process weak or mixed messages. The subconscious works best when you're focused on one issue. Less is more. Focus, the individuality, makes us happy. Focus and individuality makes us happy. Happiness is not outside us. Happiness is inside. Our minds and our emotions, from what we think of ourselves, make, ha make us happy or unhappy. We are happy if we have high self-respect and self-esteem. Self-esteem can only temporarily be boosted by drugs or drinks, flattery, power, money, deceiving ourselves. Yet the reliable, lasting way of sight and high self-esteem is by nurturing the best of our lives and the best of ourselves. Nurturing the best of ourselves, a positive and accurate self-image is based off individuality as an authentic sense from who we are and why life lives our way lasting happiness cannot be gained through consumption happiness requires active participation in what you value do the things well enjoy them and take pride in what you have done these fertilize happinesses this this fertilizes happiness they demand development and the individuality reaching for the best only in the areas that suit you is more fun than bother getting the best becomes relatively easy it's a funny thing about life if you refuse to accept anything but the best, you very often get it. Somerset Magam. Creative emotions possess and delight us. Creative emotions delight us. They come from a caring, attention focused, consisting dreams from passionate that we want to create. To dance well, love well, raise children well, play golf well, cook well, ask questions well, direct a movie well. Inspired actions make us happy individuals, and the individuality that helps us to focus and make us happy. The 80, the 80 20 way to focus and improvement. The 80-20 way to focus and improvement. Here's the three-step process to make dramatic improvements to any part of your life. Step one, focus on 80-20 destination, where you want to be. 80-20 destination, where you want to be. Step two, find the 80-20 route, the easiest way to the destination. The easiest way to the destination. Step three, 80-20 action. Take first key steps. The first key steps. Take the first key steps. Step one, focus on your 80-20 destination. A destination is where you want to arrive and where you want to be. Destination means your goals, dreams, objectives throughout life, what you want to achieve, the kind of place you want to be, the people you want to be with, the kind of person you want to become, the experiences you want to, be, the, you want to have, the quality of your life, where you most care about arriving, the life that suits and expresses you. Using the law of focus, where less is more, you need to think carefully about the particular personal destination that is best for you. To be happy... We each need a unique 80-20 destination that cuts the great majority of tri trivial objectives and defines our own extremely relevant subset of vital objectives. Focusing on our 80-20 destination means solving the riddle of less is more for each individual. What are a few vital characteristics or results that will make us happiest? What are the very few qualities that must, we must focus on and multiply, not worrying about all the rest? The 80-20 destination is a very small part of an available destination, but the one that is central to our personality and deepest desires. And what happens when you truly focus on your 80-20 destination is that we make less more. If you are the exceptional selective and find a few things that matter deeply to you, life requires a purpose and a meaning way beyond what is bad or had previously when you have somewhat concerned about a large number of issues. Matter deeply. Think about what matters deeply to you. So who and what do you want to become? If you strip away all the acting and all the role-related trappings, who is the authentic you? What is the best 20% of you? A good way to answer the question is to define your 20% spikes. Let's take the example of my friend Steve, who runs in a restaurant in Cape Town. Steve's 20% skills, interest spikes, show the figure on five on page 56, are entertainment, hospitality, rock music, starting businesses and teaching, understanding people and verbal skills. He's ideally suited for starting and running a funky restaurant. Figure six on page 57, despites, despites Steve's 20% emotional, personal spikes, inspiring leadership, teamwork, being trusted, and a zest for life. Use figure seven on, and eight on page 58 and 59 to chart your own 20% spikes. Put dots where you think they belong for each attribute and then join the lines up. I want to make a name for myself in the restaurant trade, Steve says. Not just to Cape Town and South Africa, but internationally. I'm committed to Tracy for our life and to our children. I want them to grow up loved and have and lead happy lives. Besides creating and building a new restaurant, I enjoy leading and training people so that they can become the best that they can do in their jobs. I'm still learning about what it takes to make a restaurant great, and I will continue learning. Is there anything else, I ask, that you really care about? No, he says. Steve knows his 80-20 destination. Do you? Can you limit what you are trying to become and do down to the essentials that really matter? If so, you can make less more. Try filling in your destination. 
My 80-20 destination is write 1 through 5. My 80-20 destination is 1 through 5. Check. Bullet 1. Does the 80-20 destination reflect what you truly want and care about? Does it mirror your individuality? Is it unique to you? Does it bolster the best of your talents and emotions? Does it focus on you? Will it avoid squandering energy on many other things? Does it exclude lots of objectives that recently soak up large parts of your energy? Is it short enough for you to remember all the time? Does it excite you? Is it a dream life for you? But most importantly, will you pursue it? Prove less is more for you? Will pursuing it prove that less is more for you? Step two, find the 80-20 route. What's the best and easiest route for your 80-20 destination? Knowing what to do, knowing what you want, how you want to make a large improvement in your life and while doing less overall. Bullet one, there's always many possible routes to any destination. A large majority of routes from which being greater, inferior to the few of the routes. A large majority of the routes will be greatly inferior to a few of the routes. The 80-20 routes we select are many times easier than more productive than other routes. There's always a route that provides an elegant and relatively easy solution. A way to get more and way to get much more of what we want from much less energy and time, money and bother. All we have to do is to find it. Probably someone else has already discovered the route or one very similar who has been spectacularly successful reaching the objective similar to the 80-20 destination. How do they manage it? Routes are always personal affairs. Pick one that suits you particularly well. Routes become easier with help from allies. Think hitchhiking who can give you a lift. But the acid test is whether or not you devise an 80-20 route is this. Does the route offer more with less? Does it give you not only a better solution but also an easier one? Unless it is both better and easier, it won't lead to a major improvement in your life. It has to be better and easier. As a simple and literal illustration of routes, let's assume that the destination is a Paddington train station in London. You live in East London, close to the Tobe subway stop. You're always walking, but it isn't practical for six miles, and you need to get to the Paddington quickly. Looking at the tube map, you plan to go directly from the local station to the central line to Notting Hill Gate, the change of a circle line to Paddington. All fine and dandy, yet what is it that you want? An 80-20 route is both faster and also better. Try this. Leave the tube at Lancaster Gate Station two stops before Notting Gate. Take a relaxed walk to Paddington. Occupy no more than five minutes. Altogether, you save yourself the station's travel on the tube. is well known as a hassle, changing from the line all another and waiting for a new train. The 80-20 route is easier, more pleasant, yet quicker too. More with less. Or imagine, or imagine, you're in a southern Spain in a rush to get from San Pedro to the coast of Seville. Three hours drive inland. You're a nervous driver and usually get lost. The road to Seville starts at 30 miles of the hairpin bends throughout the mountains of Pas Ronda. There are many changes of direction and the route is hard to follow. There is no other way to Seville that there's any other near the shore to direct. You're grimly set off. But, what if you follow the 80-20 way and demand more with less, a solution that's easier for you? You also take less time, even though it would take a few precious extra miles. You study the map carefully and ask the cashier and service station to help. Tells you what is the price for a small town. You could take the freeway from Malaga, then another freeway to Seville. How long will it take? Two hours, she says. If you drive fast, it is clearly marked. Even the grandmother couldn't get lost. She laughs. You find she is right. The freeway is clearer, clearly marked, and almost completely empty. The Spanish hate paving tolls. By taking an extra extra time to thinking, you've found a much easier route that is also faster, more with less. Be clever, however, about your objectives before deciding in a route. The Seville example, the best route would be differently if you had plenty of time. Enjoying driving on challenging roads and placing a premium on beautiful scenery. If so, you'd pick the mountain route for Via Ronda. It would offer you more with less, more interesting and stunning views for less distance and cost. The destination is not only Seville, but also for the fun of getting there. This is typical for life from which you live to the full. It's important for you to know that you want to achieve of what you don't want to achieve. It's important for you to know that you want to achieve, you got to know what you want to achieve and what you don't want to achieve. And it is the equal of the greater importance to know how you want to live, how you don't want to live, what person you want to be and the person you don't want to be. Of course, my travel examples are rather trivial. There's a meant to be provide simple and memorable illustrations of the 80-20 routes. It's not meant to imply that there's always a better travel plan of the ones touring routes of the Waitley enough to a fret over. But for your key 80-20 destinations, it's worth substantial thought to devise a better and an easier route so that you get more with less. It is certainly the case for finding the route to your best 20%. How do we do this? Back to see Steve. He has discovered an 80-20 route. 
I've made a start, he says, and he tells me, I found Banker from the Overseas, and I've opened up the restaurant two years ago. It won the best Cape Town restaurant competition last year, and everyone agrees it's a cool place. But I want to have a chain of these restaurants in South Africa, then overseas. The first step is to open a Johansenberg. To do this, I need to find new backers, and I'm close to having that done. Then I have to prove that an idea will work on Joburg, will work in Joburg. So that there's nothing else important on the route, I ask. Is there any one thing, Steve says, I need to mentor from America or Europe or Australia to get a better to get better at what I do I need someone who's better than me to help stretch and stimulate me I haven't found the mentor yet but it's a key object this year what is the 80-20 route to your best 20% there are always many possible routes the 80-20 route is the best fastest most fun least worrisome and least effortful way to get to there to get there it is the 80-20 route it is also here in the rub it's here in the rub, the way you are least likely to be following now or to dream up on the spot. The way you are least likely to be following now or dream up on the spot. Why? Because the 80-20 way is like the 80-20 principle. It's counterintuitive. It offers much better answers simply because of the right solution is not readily visible to us. Conditioning. Conditioning is where we, is where we were to take the total picture and the 100% of our experience left us to our own devices. We devised a route that offers more for, for more. The challenge is to craft a route offering more for less. Therefore, in finding an 80-20 route to your best 20%, try these eccentric questions. An eccentric question, what's the route to your 80-20 destination that you would normally pursue? This is not the answer. Instead, it's the standard against the judge a possible 80-20 route. Unless you can draw up an approach that is usually better than a habitual answer, you don't yet have your 80-20 route. Your answer has to be better than your instant answer. Now ask, how can you make a vast improvement on your habitual answer by unreasonably demanding more with less? Divide the improvement into two parts. First, how could you get more? What would be much better way for you? What would you enjoy more? What would you get away with more of the 80-20 destination more quickly? What would you enjoy more and what would you get? And what would get you to your 80-20 destination more quickly? Brainstorm all possible routes. If you're short of ideas, ask a friend or three for help. It's always easier to solve problems. It's always easier to solve someone else's puzzle. Second, ask how the route could be made easier for you and dream up many ideas. Then put them together until you have a way that you might work as definitely offers more with less. Even if it's not sure if it'll work, try it. If it fails, move on to the second choice of route. But only if it too offers more with less. If you're stumbling for an answer, go back to the 20% spikes. The things that you are best at come naturally to you. We'll give you clues on how the best, how you can get best and get more with less. For example, earlier in my life, my 80-20 destination was to become a successful, well-paid management consultant. The first route I tried seemed very promising. I landed a job with one of the best, fastest growing American firms in the Boston Consulting Group, the BCG. Sadly, or as it's later turned out happily, though my clients seemed to like me, my boss didn't, and I just uh, about managed to resign before I got fired. The second route I devised was to join Bain and company, a spin-off from BCG. They had failed the first time around with a huge dent to my ego. I determined to correct things that had sunk me before. My lazy style, independence of spirits, irreverence, reputation for frivo fr frivolity. I decided to make a big deal of working, unbelievably hard, brown-nosing my bosses and presenting a series of responsible sides of my nature. I would not fail again and I would prove to the folks at BCG wrong and their judgment of me was the first right thing to do, yes and no. Bain was a fine choice. I had a great business formula, exclusive focus on serving the top person in any client organization grew even faster than BCG. Talent was so thin that the groin in Bain that I rapidly got promoted to junior partner. I re my rebel instincts, projecting a a convincing image of my company loyalty and loyalist as a team builder. I was heading nicely along my 80-20 destination, but one day I stopped to think, what was I doing? Was I really following an 80-20 route? Clearly not. I'm donning my Bane mask. I was seeking more with more. More success, more interesting work, more responsibility, more money, fine. But the bargain I struck for is putting me more to, more intense work, more hours, more single-minded devotion to the job and firm, more politicking, more worry, more conformity to the boss's predilections, and more worrisome, worrisome international travel, someone who believed in more with less. This was far from ideal. What about my 20% spikes? Was I playing properly to these? Alas, no. I'm good at ideas, suddenly insight, spotting talent, telling clients to do more with their money. I'm a bad at sustaining hard work. I'm a sprinter, a long distance runner, appearing to grave and serious internal politics and this whole messy business of managing other people. Was Bane at the right place for me? Not really. I was not straight-laced or loyal enough. Was I finding it and strained to appear in this Bane-like? 
You bet. My first thought was that I had enough money and I should take life easier. Get off the management consulting altogether. That would be less with less. Less work, less strain, less stress, less also money, less interesting work. I hadn't yet reached my 80-20 destination. I still wanted to prove that I could get there. Besides, I profess to believe more with less. So having a going to contrive more with less, I had to do what I wanted. I wanted less angst, less conformity, less suppression of my true nature, less travel, less intense work, fewer administrative duties, fewer boss, preferably none at all. If I can have no boss, I wanted more work with interesting clients, more independence, more time with my family and friends, more freedom to select my colleagues, and also, let's be honest, even more money. To state my desire desires was to answer them. In spelling out what's more with less, I less I wanted, the 80-20 the route rapidly became clear. To state my desires was to answer them. I'm spelling out what more and less I wanted. The 80-20 route rapidly became clear. The only way I can get more with less and the exact way I wanted was to start my own firm. And yet this isn't quite true. On thinking deeper, I realized that I didn't want to administrate the responsibility of having Koch and Co., nor did I think about I had a full set of skills to found a truly premium to the firm, a preeminent to the firm. I think I had the full set of skills and found a truly preeminent firm. The ideal 8020 route for me was to co-found a firm with two other partners whose 20% spikes exactly complemented mine. I firmly believe that the most ambitious destination and route can also be the easiest. If only if they precisely matched your strengths. In working at Bain & Co., I successfully corrected my weaknesses, but really, I only papered over the most evident cracks. Correcting our weaknesses, the most became the mediocre. If we hone our new super strengths, 82% spikes insist on behaving that is authentic and true to our inner selves. Remember our 20% spikes. It's unreasonable demands more with less, and the sky's the limit. Step 3. 80-20 action. What is 80-20 action and how does it differ from actions we normally take in life? There are three liberating differences. 80-20 action. Bullet one. 80-20 action is dictating by your own uniqueness. 80-20 destination and 80-20 route. 80-20 actions focuses on very few actions that are proven to give you great majority of the happiness and fulfillment. Less is more. 80-20 actions involves less total action and greater total results. More with less. Once I had decided 80-20 destinations to be successful management consultants, 80-20 route to start from a new firm with two partners, 80-20 actions was obvious. There was only two actions necessary to find the partners and start the firm. Once I made my destination, all other actions was taking every day was a trivial many, minding many partners and starting the firm because of vital few. Though it wasn't clear how I was going to take these two actions, they were all a really thought and cared about. Here's the eerie thing. Two months after I made my decision, I'd start not taking the 80-20 action. I couldn't decide which of my colleagues to approach about starting a competing firm. And wrong would move fast and wrong move could find me out of a job. Then a chance to intervene. I called in Ian Fisher, a colleague and a friend, about our current project. And the end of the call, he let something fl slip. The end of the call, he let something slip. There's something weird going on with Jim and Ian, two of the other junior partners. We can't really speak about it. But they made a sudden trip to Boston, Bain and Co.'s headquarters. What's going on, Ian? I can't tell you, Richard, but it's really strange and it's really bad. What do you mean you can't tell me? We're close colleagues, and it's come to that? I'm your boss. Bill Bain made me swear not to tell anyone. Me taking a wild guess. Have they resigned? Silence after a long pause. You said that I didn't. Jim Lawrence, phone rang and rang. Ian Evans' phone was off the hook. I jumped on my bicycle and rode along with Thames' towpath to his home and coup. I found the hold up together, shell-shocked after a traumatic encounter with Bill Bain. Were they going to start a new firm? Yes. Could I be their partner? Maybe. Yes. Chances I'd taken from my 80-20 action for me, or had it. There's a marvelous sentence in Pablo Colo's fable, The Alchemist. When you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you achieve it. When you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you achieve it. I think that's right. When you're clear about the 80-20 destination, the 80-20 route, and the chances events of giving your plans mighty shoves in the right direction, but the key phase is when you know your destiny. You need to know when you know your destiny. If you had known the 80-20 destination, the 80-20 route, I would have impressed the Ian Fisher about the cryptic remarks. I probably wouldn't have guessed what had happened, and I wouldn't have apparently impulsively jumped on my bike. I was a long ride, and I had other plans, of course, that morning, but I still had to take action. But actions are easier, and you've narrowed down the field of down of why you're obsessed with what is right for you. Action doesn't always have to be pre-planned. Desire does have to be pre-planned. Being open 
happen if a chance of events of interpreting and exploiting them properly is part of the 80-20 way. Ultimately, if you don't take the few 80-20 actions of your life, your life won't be transformed. If you don't take them, they can multiply happiness out of all proportions to an effort. Make the most of your difference. Nobody else can. Focus on the best of yourself so that less is more. Find the route of transforming your life so that you get more results and less worry and less effort. The act of being open to a great luck to that universe will try to bestow onto you. When you discover and select the authentic parts of yourself and make them work smoothly and easily, you'll be uniquely highly valuable and yes, very happy too. Chapter 5. Enjoy work and success. It's true hard work never killed anyone, but I figure, why take the chance? Ronald Reagan. Remember the Woody Allen movie, The Purple Rose of Cuddle? Mia Farrow is sitting on the audience watching her favorite film. Suddenly the actor Jeff Daniels, bored with recitement of the same lines time and time and again, jumps in front of the movie into a cinema. He snatches Mia Farrow off, unleashing a fabulous love affair. There, I think, lies the secret of success. I mean, I don't mean grabbing Mia Farrow. I mean the ability to switch between ordinary life as life as it could be into life it could be. I mean having an idea or a fantasy or a passion and acting on it. Stepping out of a life of duty where everything runs those predictable lines dictated by other people into a life created by your own imagination. Jump into a life created by your own imagination. For our ability to move between this world and the world that is for the world of our own minds, thinking, imagining, creating, and enjoying, other, other animals can work hard and only humans can think hard. Other animals are programmed by evolution. People are too, but we can also program ourselves and change the world we find into a world we prefer. The whole edifice of the modern civil civilization rests on the drudgery, muscle power, repetition of long hours of work, but on insight, inspiration, inventness, originality, and enterprise, on moving between where we are now in the real world and where the world we dream up will be in our minds, and then make that real. What is true for humanity as a whole is also true for individuals. The most successful people can change the world not only through sweat and tears but through ideas and passion. It is not a matter of hard work of time for a matter of the job. It's having a different view, an original idea, something that expresses their individuality and creativeness. Success from, comes from thinking that they're acting on those thoughts. So if you believe that your hard work of you believe you have to do hard work and do unpleasant things to be successful, then think again. Do you imagine that Bill Gates, former colleague, dropout founder of Microsoft, became the world's richest man through hard graft? Do you think that the Warren Buffet, the master and investor, the world's second richest person, works very hard? What about the media mongols, Oprah Winfrey, Rupert Murdoch, Rupert Murdoch? What's different about them? Devotion to hard slog or great new ideas? What about Ronald Reagan, John F. Kennedy, Winston Churchill, Albert Einstein, Charles Darwin, William Shakespeare, Christopher Columbus, Jesus Christ. These giants weren't chained to their desk. They weren't chained to their desk. What they all did was spend their time from what mattered to them on a few essentials from where they exerted leadership. Little or no time, they had the mass of trivia occupying their hard work contemporaries. There is a difficult way to process and there's a difficult way to success. And there's an easier way. The difficult way is to study hard for a long time and work hard 60 hours or more a week for several decades, worrying about the impression you're giving, and claw your way to the top of an organizational pyramid. Sacrifice a pleasant life, now in hope for much more of a pleasant future life. Try to do extraordinary things at an extraordinary cost to get extraordinary results. The 80-20 way is easier. It's an open to everyone, including those who are far behind in an education and career stakes. Make a greater mental lead. Dissociate effort from reward. Focus on the outcomes that you want and find it easier for a way for you to achieve, the, achieve them with least effort, least sacrifice, most pleasure. Concentrate on what produces extraordinary results without extraordinary effort. Be efficient but relaxed. First think results. Get them with least energy. Bullet 1. 20% of work, effort, resources give 80% of the results, which gives us 80% of our outcome for 20% effort, and 400% outcome for 100% effort. What's the ordinary way to extraordinary results? Over 80% of people struggle to achieve 20% of the results. Fewer than 20% of the people commander 80% of the goodies. In that, in your area, who are they? Who did they what do they do differently? 80% of the value to other people comes from 20% of less of what you do. What are these few vital activities? 80% of your success derives from 80% less of your skills and knowledge. What are the real valuable things that you do much better than the other people? 80% of your achievements arrive at 20% of fewer of the circumstances in which you find yourself. You shrine at specific times in particular ways with certain people when, where, and why. 80% of what comes to you 
comes from 20% of the tactics and behavior that you adopt. What behaviors have results out of the proportions to energy? What behavior has results out of all proportion to energy? For anything that you attempt, one way of doing it is markedly superior. A route delivered 80% of the results for 20% of normal effort. Experiment until you found a way that is four times better than before. Intelligent and lazy. German military chief General von Monstein said, There are only four types of officers. First, there are lazy, stupid ones. Leave them alone. They do no harm. Second, there are hard-working, intelligent ones. They make an excellent staff officer, ensuring that every detail is properly considered. Third, there are hard-working, stupid ones. These people are a menace, and they must be fired at once. They create irrelevant work for everyone. Finally, there are intelligent, lazy ones. They are suited for the highest office. Cultivate lazy intelligence. Do you lack smarts or lack laziness? If you think that you're too smart... And to think this, you have to be quite intelligent after all. Work on a knowledge and expertise in a very narrow area where extraordinary results are available for modest effort. If you are smart but not lazy, work on laziness to do everything simply because you can. Lower effectiveness, concentrate on what's really important things and get amazing results. Do only a few things with the greatest benefit. It's amazing how often people dispute this advice. A typical conversation runs like this. Friend, you must be joking when you say become lazier. Me, well, I'm dead serious. I can't focus well enough in 20% if I'm also trying to do everything else. Far better and spend twice as much time on a magic 20%, far less on the rest. Bottom line, 60% more results for 60% less energy. Friend, you should put 100% energy into the magic 20% and get four times more. Fine in theory and in practice eventually, but first slow down. Stop in essentialing things. There's a limit to how much time we could spend in a magic activities without diluting quality. Force ourselves to do less. When time to find more vital areas to work on and be more effective to do things and things we do. Friend, but you don't really believe in being lazy, do you? There are lazy people like Ronald Reagan who achieved a great deal when he was being focused on the two objectives that he had. There were super hard workers like President Carter who had too many objectives and failed phonetically. Still, there is an excellent scientist of artists obsessed in their work who love it and wouldn't tell them to become lazy. I'm not really advocating laziness. It's time to concentrate on what matters. If you don't like the word lazy, try relaxed. Do what you enjoy. Do it calmly, without worries. A hard-working person is often busy on the spot and what's really significant. A lazy person wants to do as little as possible, so concentrates only on the essentials. What's really productive to a lazy person who thinks new thoughts and is focused on making them happen. Thinking is often disturbing, sometimes often frightening, bearing ourselves in a trivia of less threatening. For most of us, the only way to create something new and valuable is to slow down, do fewer things, and chill out. If you really love what you're doing, you don't need to be lazy. If you're going through lots of things you don't enjoy, cut them, keeping, keeping just the valuable things that you're enjoying. What... What do super successful people do differently? If we want to be successful, we shouldn't see what is different about stars. I can see six common characteristics. The stars are ambitious. No surprise here. Yet their ambition is sweet and unforced because the stars love what they do. Ronald Reagan had the time of his life governing the governor of California over the eight White House years. Top authors adore writing exotic locations, higher flying, vibrant, full life, overflowing, quiet pleasures of an infectious exuberance. Research scrolly botanic investigated self-made millionaires. He covered the love that they loved their work. Their passion took them to the top. Enjoyment, not effort or education, is the key to success. Hurrah! Picture millions slaving over an educational treadmill, working in a dark satanic tower to pinch mouthpiece bosses, mean-spirited corporations. Could they all be barking up the wrong tree? Is that's your rejoice? If that's your rejoice, throw off your chains. Find something that you love doing. And if it's not, rejoice too. The treadmill ain't necessary. Most successful entrepreneurs have the university of education, usually no further educated at all. Most of them have left school and soon they could. It would be enthusiasm is what made them. It can be to you too. Those winter school graders were poor, but didn't in a bar from the success. They found something that they loved doing, where they could create something that other people wanted. You could do the same. Is there something that you love doing that you could become your business or your profession? The stars are lopsided. Stars are also well-rounded. They're all rounded and top people have massive strengths and equal, equally massive downsides, their weaknesses don't matter. What leads to extraordinary results of concentration on their strengths, honing these Olympian standards. Where you work, the professional firm, the department, job, is crucial. If 20% of your potential jobs and professional yield 80% of your potential benefits, seek jobs where your lopsided strengths comes to the fore. Balance is mediocrity. The star knows a lot about a little. Have you been to gain a broad experience? Don't focus on all your energy on one area. Become an expert on narrow front. Know 
about 1% of something. Meet all the experts, see how they work, find the kinds of lives that they lead and mimic them. The stars think and commit communicate clearly they sell and market themselves concisely how can you learn this do i stand the salesperson selling is tough it invites rejection it also teaches us how to accept rejection get on the with the different folks communicate and negotiate effectively sell anything autos high fives computers advertising space magazine subscriptions anything at all for a few months you learn how to sell yourself an essential life skill the rest of your life will be so much easier and more successful the stars evolve in their own success formula does your favorite comedian have a unique formula Formula? Is it timing, tone of voice, material used, something else distinctive? Whatever it is, imitable and invaluable. The stars didn't arrive at their formula overnight. Neither did you. Observe many formulae. Adapt to combine them into adventure own experiment. See what delivers more with less. The 80-20 ways to enjoy work and success. The 80-20 ways to enjoy work and success. Step 1. Focus on your 80-20 destination. What do you do really? What do you really want from your work? What does it mean to you? What would be ideal? What are the few things that you care most about? Below are many different things from which you might be important to you about your job. What really matters to what really matters to me is about my work. Bullet 1. What really matters to me about my work is high pay. A job I enjoy, security, good comfortable conditions, excitement, friends at work, interesting colleagues, makes me think, variety, a decent boss, hours that fit my life and not too long. Freedom to do things in my own way, employer's reputation, prestige of my own job, excellent fringe benefits, prospects for promotions, important work that benefits other people, good training and ability to add on to my skills, an inspiring boss or leader in an organization, flexible hours, work when I like, place where I'd like to meet, place where I might meet my life's love. Work that exactly fits into my own abilities. The bottom line bullets are left blank for you to fill anything else that you feel would be important or what really matters to you in your work. Tickle all the, tick all the bullets from which matter to you. Remember to remember the bullets of what matters to you. Now remember the need to focus on less is more. Pick the one or two or the three ideally just for one point that matters the most of your happiness. Your choice points towards the 80-20 destination for work. It can be more specific. I want to be a movie director. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a management consultant. And so on and so the better. What is really strange is that many talented people pursue jobs and careers that do not make them and their families happy. Or happy as a different job or career could. Of my good friends, I figured at least half was not chosen as a career the path that they'd make them the happiest. They put up success with money ahead of the enjoyment, fulfillment, and purpose. Most of them have made good money. Did the extra happiness from money and status outweigh the extra happiness from which would derive from more of a fulfill fulfilling work? I doubt it. Here's an intriguing fact. Dividing my friends into those who chose the jobs they loved on one hand and those who worked for money and success on the other, it was a former group who have made, on an average, more money. Those who worked for fun and fulfillment rather than money also tended to make more money. Work is more fun than fun. Noel Coward said, Now hard evidence backs him up. Psychologist Mahali Sitsemahalia has pioneered research into flow. Those moments peak happiness. When time stands stills, when you find yourself doing exactly what you want to be doing, never wanting it to end, rather like a happiness island discussed earlier. He says, Americans derive much more flow from a work from which is a leisure time. Flow derives from the sense of personal mastery and active achievement. Work is matched to our strengths that leads to our clear and positive results, giving enormous satisfaction. Success is not and should not be seen as desperate process of piling up wealth and conspicuous consumption of material goods in order to impress other people. This is the game from which nobody except perhaps Bill Gates for a limited time can win. A millionaire, conspicuously consumption of a dwarfed by billionaires, setting off never-ending chains of competition and envies that destroys our balance of benevolence and drains our energy, and is far more removed than anyone's authentic needs and desires. In success, as in everything else, and less is more, quality is more valuable than quality. Quality is more valuable than quantity. Giving more is satisfying the consuming abundant time, triumphs abundance good, serenity is better than striving. striving. And love giving generates love received. When all we want to do deep down is abundant time, is security, is an affection, peace, tranquility, spiritual awareness, self-confidence, and a sense in which we're expressing ourselves and creating things that we love of great value for other people, true success is being able to spend our time in how we want, fulfilling our uniqueness, talent, being valuable to people we love and value, and being loved. It's very clear, therefore, from what success means to you that you seek that, not the world's definition of success, a tawdry, second-handed concept of everyone else's professes to believe, but nobody actually experiences it or enjoys it. You don't always have to change your job to enjoy it more. Maybe you can simply change the way that you do it. My barber and my tennis coach tell me that their lives ask me about mine. I get free therapy with every haircut and tennis lesson. They enjoy their work more this way.
My mother, who used to be a nurse, was just a hosp was in was just in a hospital for a week. She remarked how much more nurses today chat to their patients and talk to their families, involving them with restoring the patients to health. Could you do something to add meaning to the value of your job? In this idea, we can enjoy work just by a pie in the sky. Not everyone agrees that they can enjoy their work. My friend Bruce complains about his work. He took me to task when I said, get a job you like. Get a job you like. As far as I'm concerned, he said, what you say is a pie in the sky. I don't like my job, but at least it's permanent and secure, which is a lot these days. I don't think they understand how tough it is to today's workplace, especially for those of us without qualifications. Haven't you heard about this casualization? All the permanent jobs are being replaced by contracts and casual positions. I'm just hoping to hang out on my job. That's the peak of my ambition. The idea of having a career I love is just a big pipe dream. Well, let's look at it this way, I countered. A hundred years ago, work was grim and tedious. Nobody stopped to ask whether they could enjoy it or not, but today's millions, people reveal and revel in their work. And more that they love it, the more successful they are. But why don't you do the same? Finding a job that you enjoy may be hard and take a long time, I added, but it's also, oh, so of course, it's always possible to every single person. I know who has already tried to find a job who has loved to manage it. Eventually, almost nothing you could do. Bruce will affect your happiness for your whole life more than finding a job you like. It's worth using all your effort to imagination to an imagination on this. How can you say that you just always... How could you say that you can always get a nice job, Bruce said, and unemployment shooting up and good jobs are like this or like gold dust? Well, I said that's true, but even the high unemployment, there's always jobs, there's always hope. Why not make a list job of that you know would be suspect you'd enjoy? Spend a lot of time in that. Make a really long list whether or not you think you could create your own job. Have a lots of acquaintances who've been through this sequence. First they fired on retirement and then the job they dislike eventually created their own job and they like either persuading someone else to employ them or through self-employment out of desperation really as they'd zero chance of a normal job. Either they'd make a go for the job that doesn't work but they'd make it their second job and third try and they'd make it on their second or third try. They nearly always end up relishing in their new work. Often makes a small fortune, too. Isn't it better to go through the process without being fired and when you're still quite young? Maybe Bruce said, but the jobs I'd like have hundreds of better qualified people going for them. It's true, I said. You're competing against many people for a great job, but motivation matters hugely. Whether you really want your job or not shows through more than people imagine. There could be 20% unemployment in the category, yet someone is 100% more motivated. They get the job or a similar one sooner or later. Many friends have jobs that they don't like because they're secure and they get paid well. And they get pressure from their wives, husband or partner, parents or peers or teachers and other friends who have moved jobs like that and pay less well and found some way of dealing with the money. By downscaling their spending, having two or more workers in the family or using savings, they generate happiness and what they and their families are happier, right? And they, they think that they and their families are happier right away. None of them regretted it after a time. Many made more money, too. Step 2. Find your 80-20 route. Chapter 6. Unmask the mystery of money. The greatest force in the world. Compound interest. Albert Einstein. A famous financer advised spoke to the money management class about a great book, The Richest Man in Babylon by Paul Glason. There's really one message in this book, the financial guru said, and it's still true today. To have no future financial worries, all you need to do is to save and invest 10% of your income for long-term growth. The lecturer asked the group, who had paid good money to learn how to straighten out their finances, who read the book, about two-thirds of the audience put up their hands. Please keep up your hands for the moment, he said. Now everyone who follows the key message of the book saved the 10% uh, of their income. Please have their hands up and the rest of you put your hands down. About 100% 100 of the people that put their hands up, every single one, put their hands down. They'd all understood and agreed with the message that what mattered to them. Yet none of them had taken the simple action necessary. How come? To some extent, because action is always more difficult than thinking about action. But to a larger extent, because Paul Glason's book didn't provide an easy method for saving. I'll make you a deal with you. I'll make a deal. I'll make a deal with you and I'll provide you an easy way out of a money problem, providing you promise to take it, to act on an easy answer. If you're not prepared to take a proposal deal, then skip this chapter, because you won't derive any benefit from reading it. Three mysteries of money have baffled people for time immemorial. Immemorial, number one, bullet. Why do a few people have most money and most people have very little? Is there a reliable way to make all the money you need? Can money buy happiness? If not, what's the point of it? The good news is that money's mystery can be unmasked. Wilfredo's earth-shattering discovery. 
Vilfredo's earth-shattering discovery. The earth-shattering discovery over 100 years ago, a shaggy-haired Italian economist got a real shocker. Professor Vilfredo Pareto of Lausanne University was investigating wealth in Britain. He found a curiosity lopsided picture. Few people had most of the money. Then he looked at the statistics on Britain wealthier in earlier centuries every time he got almost the identical picture. Pareto compared wealth in America, Italy, France, Switzerland, elsewhere. And every country with statistics had the same result. A lot of money operated anywhere and everywhere at any time, Pareto explained his law badly. Not until 1950 did Joseph Gerrand rename it the 80-20 principle and 20% of the people enjoyed 80% of the money. In Pareto's time, taxes were very low. In the last century, governments around the world taxed the rich to give to the poor. Yet Pareto's picture hasn't budged. Pareto's picture hasn't budged. The wealthiest 20% of Americans own 84% of the money. The planet's top 20% corner 84% of the money. These numbers are shocking. Money and the 80-20 principle are more powerful than governments. Why do 20% own 84%? Money is a force like a wind, waves, and weather. Money is like being equally distributed. Money clones money. Why? How can we attract money? Money obeys the 80-20 principle because the compound interest, Einstein's the most powerful force in the universe. Compound interest. Start with the small draw up and dollop of money and save and invest it then compound interest will do the rest 1946 Ann Scheiber who knew little about money put five thousand dollars to the stock market she locked it away and shared certificates and stopped worrying by 1995 her modest nest egg had transmogrift into 22 million dollars a 440 thousand percent all courtesy of compound interest we never save money we will always be poor no matter how much money we earn if you never save money you're gonna always be poor no matter how much money you earn most people have very little money because they don't save the typical 50 year old American has earned a great deal but has saved just twenty three hundred dollars people with the most money have typically saved and invested it for many years compound interest multiplies savings in a breathtaking way how anyone can make a million. Is it really true, asked Karen, my personal assistant, that I could become rich? Yes, I say, if you do one simple thing. Come off it, Richard. That can't be true. Enter Allison, Aaron's younger friend. Allison's a hairdresser with a pink punkish hair. If it was easy, we'd all be millionaires. You know as well as me that there are few people with all of this. She waves at a swimming pool, lush gardens, tennis court, and there are all the rest of us, struggling with money. Aaron, Allison, and I are basking and basking in November sunshine, sipping ice cold drinks in a house in Spain. I make the most of my captive audience. You're right, I tell Allison. Most people, even with big jobs and incomes to match, don't have much spare cash. I don't say it's easy to accumulate money. I just say it's possible for everyone. So what's the secret? Aaron is 23, right? Assumes he saves $200 a month. Pigs will fly, said Allison. Maybe I say, but imagine he saves and invests 200 a month, and it grows at a 10% a year for 42 years until he's 65. How much would Aaron have then? 200 a month is $2,400 a year times 42 is $100,000 and change. But you have to add the growth on top. So I face Aaron. What's your guess? Maybe double 200, Allison? I'm no good at some, she says, but it couldn't be that much. Maybe 150,000. The right answer, I reveal, is over 1.4 million. In. They're stunned. That assumes Aaron could save 10%. I don't believe that. Fine, I'll come to that later. I interrupt with Allison. What about you? Harump, she says. Nobody earns less than me. You know how little hairdressers get. Worst paid profession. Wouldn't be worth saving. How old are you? How much do you earn? 18. 16,000 a year. The 10th is 1,600. If I saved that, which I don't think I could, that would be my nest egg become. I produce calculator and a paper and a computer to quick compute a computer and faster but I demonstrated the sums Aaron fetches more drinks when he gets back I'm ready what do you think if Allison saved 1600 a year for 60 till she was 65 what could she save Aaron grabs a calculator 16 times 47 years equals seventy five thousand dollars he multiplies that by five he estimates for a compound interest of four hundred thousand dollars he guesses no way allison shrieks can't be more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars have i got news for you i tell her cliches seem expected the right answer is 1.5 million impossible she snorts i earn much less than aaron and there's not much difference in our age which say could get more him calculator must be glitched no, I say. It makes sense. The compounding is so powerful. Just in a few extra years, it makes all the difference. It makes it more important to start saving early than you earn a lot. It's all in the numbers until you say how 10% of, of our pay, said Allison. Don't see how we can. We almost spend more than we earn. I'll come to that later, I said. And I will. But first, should we care about money? Can money buy happiness? Yes, if you're poor. 
Money's better than poverty. Woody Allen equipped. Woody Allen equipped, if only the financial reasons, if only for financial reasons, if we were starving or homeless, money can bring a better life. But beyond a certain point, a surprisingly low point, more money doesn't deliver more happiness. A study of tens of thousands of people in the 29 countries' comparative age lives, satisfaction in each country with an average purchasing power, see figure 9. It showed that in poor countries, purchasing power and life satisfaction are clearly related. Yet once countries in half rich of America, there's absolutely no relationship between money and happiness. Figure 9. Life satisfaction and purchasing power in 29 countries. Looking within individual countries bears this out. Very poor Americans are less happy, but otherwise money does not affect happiness. Being one of the 100 richest Americans add only a smidgen to happiness. Or considered a study of 22 lottery jackpot winners who showed initial euphoria, it didn't last. Within a year, the winners were no longer happy than they were before. More evidence, real purchasing power. In the three rich country, richest countries doubled between 1950 and 2000, yet happiness levels didn't raise at all or rise at all. At the countries become wealthier, depressed or sores, depression sore, with victims also suffering at the much younger ages. The evidence is overwhelming. Being moderately well-off means that you are happier than you are very poor. But once you are well-fed and in a clothed and house getting wealthier, probably it won't make you any happier. In the 19th century, John Stuart Mill gave an excellent reason for this being true. We don't want to be rich. We just want to be richer than other people. When our life standards improves, but everyone else does too, we don't feel better off. We forget that our, that our cars and our houses are better than before because our friends are all driving similar cars and they have just a pleasant home as you. Right now, I'm living in South Africa. Here I feel rich. In a European-American, I don't feel my feelings has nothing to do with how I well I feel is, or how well I, I am off, but everything to do with how well off other people are. Living standards are much lower in South Africa, so I feel wealthy. There's, no, all, there's also the pain and hassle of making money. On April 8, 1991, Time Magazine's cover story highlighted the price paid for successful careers. 61% of 500 professionals said that earning a living today requires so much effort that it's difficult to find any time to enjoy life. 38% that they were cutting back to sleep to earn more money. 69% they'd had to slow down to live more relaxed lives, and 19% wanted a more exciting, faster paced life. 56% wanted to find more time for personal interests and hobbies. 89% said it was more important to them to spend more time with their families or something that their careers, which is something their careers made difficult. How are you doing now? How many of us fled that rat race? Nah, we're still chasing more money than more and more time. The average working American now works 2,000 hours a year. That's two weeks more than in 1980, and the average middle-income couple with children now in 39,018 hours between them, seven weeks just before 10 years ago. More money can be a trap, leading for more spending, more commitment, more worry, more complexity, more time administering money, more desires, more time at work, less choice from which we spend our time, and degradation of our independence and life's energy. Our lifestyle locks into a work style. How many houses or cars do we need to compensate for the heart attacks and or depression? More with less. More life energy with less money. Joe Dominguez and Vicky Robin make a wonderful breakthrough in thinking about money and life satisfaction in their best salary. Your money and your life. The key insight that money is something that we trade for life energy for. In earning money, we sell our time, which in really is life energy. And the effort to make a living consumes our life. The understanding of how much life is in demand being consumed by our work. We overestimate what we are getting in return. That's a bad bargain. As Dominguez and Robin point out, are you working for less than you're worth and bringing home less money than you need? Are you earning far more than you need for fulfillment? What is your purpose of that extra money? And if it serves no purpose, would you want to work less and have more time to do what matters to you? If work less, if you work less and have more time to do what matters to you, if does not serve if it does not serve your purpose to you, is it so clear and so connected with your values that it brings you joy to your hours at work? If not, it needs to change. When you break the link between work and money, you give yourself an opportunity to discover what true work is, and it may be out of totally unrelated to you from what you're currently doing for money. The 80-20 way offers more life energy for less effort. Bullet one. Through saving and accumulating money, we avoid trading life energy for money. We uh, enough investment income, we can stop depleting our life's energy throughout unfulfilling work and choose our work by our hours. By doing what is important to us, from which we enjoy, we multiply our life's energy. We might decide to use savings to subscribe an ideal life work style. Maybe work six months a year and then travel around the world or do whatever it takes to undertake a project for our family. Or work three days a week and routinely enjoy long weekends. We might put, cut pay cuts, take a pay cut, and work where we want, or become our own boss. Instead of money ruling our lives, making work successful and miserable, we can use money to regain, can, re regain control of our lives. We can deploy energy from where we most are carefree, creative, and content. Use time and money intelligently. Make less go further. The quality and value of time soars once we 
control them. Success can be self-defeating. We sacrifice our independence and time to make money, believing that more money will make us happier. And it doesn't. All we do is squander off our life and energy at a higher level of affluence. The 80-20 way breaks the law game. However much so little we earn or save and invest in multiplying money, we are less conceived about our careers than we are enjoying our work. When we built up the substantial savings, they feed our independence. We spend our life as things in which we care most about. The 80-20 way to benefit from money is number one. Step one, focus on your 80-20 destination. Writing down your ideal destination works wonders. Of Yale's 1953 graduation class, only 3% set written financial goals similar to the 80-20 destination. 20 years later, research discoveries found that these 3% had more money than all the 97%. Write down your 80-20 destination and is it as it is. Write it down your destination today. Is it to be free of money worries, to be able to afford to do the work you want, to live your life that you want, to have enough to be able to buy a home, to give up needing two paychecks to live, to be financially independent at a certain age, be able well off and live off an investment income without needing to work for money, to become a millionaire, some other objectives. Is your 80-20 destination extremely important to you and why? Money is the means, not an end. Money is for freedom, not slavery. For security, not worry. Unless money is used to give you a greater freedom and happiness, accumulating money is a burden. Be specific. You want to be free of money worries? Fine. But what does this mean? Enough to live on no income for six months, two years, having a particular sum of money in the bank? You'd greatly prefer another job that pays less. Fine. What job? What does it pay? How would your monthly expenses be? The good news is that they might be much lower, perhaps because of the less expensive work clothes, lower commuting costs, and be able to live in a less expensive area. Helen and James are lawyers in their late 20s. They made it work, fell in love, and got married. They work for a high-powered law firm at bully break in dismay and moving up in the ranks. The only problem is, is that they hate the work and the firm. The 80-20 destination for Helen and James is to leave the firm and start a family. Helen will retire. James will want to work for a legal advice charity. Even though it pays much less, how are they going to get there? Step two. Find the 80-20 route. Because of the compound interest, money becomes concentrated in a few hands. And there is a therefore one, the only one, infallible 80-20 route. Enough money to save and invest is the easiest way possible. There are many difficult ways to save. Budget is one. Budgeting doesn't work because unexpected expenses may always blow off your course. Happily, there's an easy 80-20 route to savings. Aaron tells the secret of easy savings. I like the idea of making some money, Aaron tells Ellison, not to become a millionaire, but to have a deposit to buy a home of my own. That's the 80-20 destination, Richard calls it. It's where I want to go. But then I thought, how can I possibly save? Mom, I can never save. Neither could I. Last year, Richard told me to save. I really tried, but the end of the month was still nothing left. So how could I save? And Richard said, well, there's an answer to that, too. Save first, he said. Pay yourself first. That means save 10% to your pay before you spend any. That saves automatically. The savings go straight to your special savings account on payday. You could spend it, or it's gone already. But the difference is the same. But it's the same difference, he said. You don't have a monthly start in the month, I'll run out faster. By month, I'll be starving. But Richard said, no, it's not the same, you'll see. He was right. I really don't miss the money. It must. I just must stretch it longer because there was less to start with in my pocket. I couldn't believe it before I convinced I couldn't save. I was convinced I couldn't save. Now I managed in the last 12 months to carry on over forever. Honestly, Allison, I could do it. Anyone could. They don't see the money just as like they were taxed before more. You earned less. Helen and James decided to stay in bulky break and destiny and save and invest 10% of their pay by automatically having it deducted, accumulating enough to eventually live their dreams. How long will it take? Together, Helen and James earn $6,500 a month after $4,000 currently. They spend it all. They have no savings. They calculated if they moved into a cheaper area near James' legal charity, they would live on $2,500 a month. Even a planned charity, even, even with a planned baby, the charity can only afford to pay James $2,600 a month. After that, it's about $2,000, so they need $500 investment income a month, $6,000 a year to plug the gap. They plan to buy an apartment for $60,000 and rent it. After repairs, maintenance, and tax, they make $6,000 a year. So they need $60,000 savings to change their lives. 10% of their annual pay is $7,800. If they invest the money 10%, that's $66,000 within six years. A vent at a 5% within a tax-exempt plan, they'll accumulate nearly $67,000 by year seven. The basic 80-20 route to making the money you need. Save and invest 10% of your income before you receive it, having it automatically channeled into a savings account. Do this as early as you can in life, which means now. Frankly, this is 95% of advice that anyone needs. This is the easy way for you to end your money's worries. No other way to remotely is such as powerful as that. Refinement to the basic 80-20 route.
Can you reach your destination faster? An advertisement. Guaranteed investment. 100% safe. Pay, t- pays between 12 and 20%. Income is tax-free. No fees or charges. No minimum amount. You could start with $1. All you have to do is pay off the total amount on your credit card. No investment is a good paying off your credit card debt. The next best investment is to retire or to retire all of your debt. Start with the most expensive, even in the mortgage. Proper property bonds, interest rates are now very low. It's almost impossible to find an investment as attractive as paying off your mortgage when you have the savings to do so. Cut up your credit cards. Be spound and spendless. Need a card? Get a debit card so you can only spend what you have in the bank. Be more selective in buying things. Only spend money on the items from which really make you happy. Spend less than 20%. It gives you 80% of pleasure and less on the rest. Ask yourself, do I really enjoy this item I'm spending my money on? Is it really 20% of the items giving me 80% of satisfaction I'm spending? If not, cut it out. You'll have more money and the best 20% of spending is more life's energy too. You don't need to spend so much time earning. Go for cheaper items that deliver most of the benefit. Two-year-old may be a 95% of a beneficial as a new or a new car at just 60% of the cost. Secondhand furniture may also be 20% of the new price with spare cash by assets that promise income to increase in value. For example, any sort of land or property, art or collectible item, pick up anything that delights you and appreciates. Save half of any pay raise. Increase your automatic saving before it hits your bank account. Spring clean each year. Get rid of the clutter. Give away small items and sell the valuable ones and invest the proceeds. Draw a wall chart for your monthly income and expenses. It'll encourage you to cut expenses and augment and augment income. See figure 10 overly for an example. Prepare a wall chart for your monthly income, expenses, and investment income. With a projection of well income, you will meet your monthly expenses. This is Financial Independence Day. You're no longer dependent on your job for a living. Figure 11. Overleaf is an illustration. Cut one item of spending. Give money away, not only as you like to give to a great pleasure, but also mysteriously, it often increases your income. Cut one item of spending and give the money away. Not only is this likely to give you a greater pleasure, but also mysteriously, it often increases your income. Figure 10, Elizabeth's wall chart of monthly income and expenses. Her money on the left going bottom to the top, money per month, and then to the bottom left to right is the time. Cover your expenses and your income. And make sure that at the end of the month, you have more income than your expenses. Figure 11, Donna's financial independence wall chart. On the top, from the left, from the bottom to the top, it's money per month. And then at the bottom left to right, it's your time. And you have to go over your monthly income, your monthly expenses, your investment income, and your projections. And compare what you have today from your independence day. It's compound interest different from investment. Compound interest is hugely powerful, but only works for once you've saved and invested in a high interest savings account or an investment like bonds, property, other assets that would likely appreciate. Be careful with bank accounts. Banks often rip off unwary customers. Many so-called high interest accounts are anything but. What rate or investment return is realistic? My example assumes 5 or 10% annually. Investment returns to the words of caution. However, first, you must try to avoid tax. Most countries have special tax-free accounts for small savers and investors, but the most be careful to put your investments in these accounts. Second, we're at a time when inflation and interest rates may be places are over the last 50-year lows. This makes it necessary to shop around. Even if you got a 5% return, the highest bank accounts may pay only 3 to 4%. Other forms of low-risk investments may be necessary. Where should you invest? The basic objective is to make at least 5% long-term annual at minimum risks. First, pay off all your debt. Invest at a risk-free savings account if they pay interest at a 5% or greater. It may be able to invest in bonds, government, or company debts or company debt that yields pay interest more than 5%. Long-term, direct investment is suitable property. Maybe at your home is attractive. Long-run property prices, really the price of a land between beneath the property have risen above 8% a year. The supply of land is fixed, yet demands tends to rise, driven to demand for larger houses, second houses, falling number of people per household. Where population and wealth are increasing, for example, most attractive in warm parts of the United States or southern Europe are expanding cities anywhere. Land is, long, land is a good long-term bet. Be cherry of stock market. It may fall and fall, but if you have enough money to invest, consider a market-neutral hedge fund. One not affected by general stock market fluctuations. Head funds may be lower risk and more attractive than traditional mutual funds, which depends on rising stock markets. Mutual funds depend on rising stock markets. Market neutral hedge funds are not affected by the market fluctuations. Shun anything. Shares, properties are the best hot trend with a recent sharp appreciation. Bubbles burst. Wait until prices fall and then stabilize. Never buy in a market that is rising or falling. In a short term, stick a safe investment even if you can only get 5%. Should you start in your own business? Most millionaires become rich by starting a venture. Be aware. Be aware only in the 20 new businesses succeed. Only 20 
new businesses succeed out of 100. Probably 99% of payoffs come from 1% of the new ventures. Will you really be lucky in the 1%? Only invest in a new venture from which always has a savings fallback on. Don't risk losing everything, and if you won't sleep at night, don't invest. Become mega rich probably won't make you happy anyway. It's a very bad gamble. If you're passionate about starting your own business, wait until you have the cash to afford to lose. Or go into a low-risk venture that requires little capital, for example, a stall in the neighborhood market, a service business like mowing lawns or cleaning cars, or delivery service using your own car. Step three, take the 80-20 action now. You're at the crossroads. You can go ahead and instruct your bank to deduct 10% of your monthly income and put into your savings account. You could then look for towards life without money worries to your 80-20 destination. Or you can do nothing. Go ahead and do it now. It takes five minutes to arrange the benefit for the rest of your life. It will be enormous. Make friends with money. Boost your life's energy immeasurably. Imagine you freed yourself from money worries, perhaps even an accumulated small fortune. How is it going to make you happier? How far will your newfound riches deepen the improve of your friendships and relationships between what you're about to see? Add the most joy in life. Money and material preoccupations pale into the background, or to the background from which we create an experience, the bonds of true love and affection. Chapter 7, Relationships, the 80-20 Way. Each person kills the thing they love throughout the modern world. Money and work both count above. Loved ones who come in third. Modern Peretti of Oscar Wilde. The project was going brilliantly from absolutely nothing. Developer had created paradise on earth. Cornucopia, a lush garden, flowering streams, palm trees, trees of every imaginable fruit. Exotic birds, dogs, cats, horses, donkeys, even a troop of tame monkeys. Multicolored mountains framed the garden in this distance. Adam could glimpse a blue sea. After taking possession, he meandered through the grounds, greeting the animals, giving them names, tasting the fruit, alternating between warm sunshine and the shades of trees. For the first time in his life, he felt totally secure, relaxed and happy he had made it the developer popped round of a cup of coffee the next morning do you like it he asked yes adam said it's fabulous he really have done a fantastic job the villa and the courtyard are perfect the gardens are gorgeous yet i have the feeling that something's missing can't quite put my finger on it though ah said the developer i was thinking about it last night you're absolutely correct and i can put it right what did you have in mind adam asked how about the developer said someone to love or the 21st century version. The Lord God had planted a garden of Eden, and there he put a man had formed a river watering gardens flowered of Eden. The Lord God had put a man in the garden to take care of it, and the Lord God said, You will rule over the fish and the birds and every living creature, and be responsible for looking over after all of them. For the benefits you may eat them, and you may eat them, provided that they continue to grow and multiply. God saw all that he had made was very good and the man agreed the next day the Lord God said to the man it is not good for you to be alone I will make a woman so that you can love her have a family and enjoy living together and raising children but the man said to the Lord God make up your mind O Lord first you tell me I must be responsible for gardening and animal husbandry and for restocking the fish and the sea and the birds of the air and for our general environment policy as well as my own hunting fishing and cooking all the full-time job don't get me wrong I love my work it's very rewarding and the garden is idyllic is idyllic but how do you expect me to have time for all this stuff love of family and relationships I can see it all getting too complicated let's keep it just you and me and all the birds in the air etc right and the Lord God scratched his head and wondered what in the world had come to what had the world come to there's only a happiness in life wrote George Sand to love and to be loved the only happiness in life is to love and be loved Carl Gustav Jung, the great psychologist, said, We need other people to be truly ourselves. We make sense of life through relationships. But here's the twist. Modern life is making the more and more difficult to find nurture and sustain love in relationships, perhaps without realizing it, certain without resisting it, the most of us are opting to a higher quantity of lower quality relationships. We have more relationships but mean less, and our romantic relationships, if ever, are more endangered and elusive. We all know that urgent work obligations in modern technology, such as personal computers, emails, cellular phones, and eating into family life, the trend is most pronounced in the United States. Twenty years ago, half all married Americans claimed that our whole family usually eats together. Now the proportion is down to a third. More women are working, fewer people are married, married people have fewer children, the number of unmarried mothers have increased, our desire for large families has slumped, divorce rates have climbed, it is the time that parents and children spend together has plummeted, the trends reflect increased economic pressures and incidents an insidious prevalence of monetary concerns like all other fixed cost families and numbers of children in them are being downsized following the business trends more and more families are outsourcing more and more activities babysitting child 
child minding, food preparation, cooking, cleaning, gardening, organizing kids, birthday parties, care of the sick of the elderly, from which were previous knit into the fabric of family relationships. Now they're outsourcing someone to take care of all of that. More families need workers to sustain their living standards. For those in the fast lane, work both partners are more demanding and are difficult to square the traditional family responsibilities. Bob and Jane. Meet my good friends, Bob and Jane. Both fun people. They lead hectic lifestyles, globe trotting for work. When I met them, they had a delightful girl, Emma, nine and eleven. A decorous and demanding dog. Two large houses. Both helped run household. Most friends were friends of Bo Jane and Bob. When Jane had projected in Brazil for three months, she took the children and Bob visited for a week holiday and odd weekends. It seemed to work, and I became concerned about the stress imposed by different demands on their time. Might they drift apart? Eight years later, they are divorced. Still friends, but bruised and regretful. And are a happier part. I doubt it. They had a great relationship. Supporting each other and their children could have had been different. I can't be sure. But I suspect that the less intense work pressure in the 1960s, or if they had followed the 80-20 way to today, they would have stuck together, or at least four people would have been happier. Do more relationships add to happiness? Do more relationships add to happiness? Carnegie Mellon University researched studies of 169 selected local people for two years, tracking their use of the Internet and its effect on happiness and relationships. Sponsored by computers and software companies, the researchers were confident that the greater variety of witness and relationships established over the web could and would decrease social isolation and increase well-being. Both sponsors of the research were startled and discerned and dis disserted about one result. The most internet relationships were established and more time spent on the web, the more lonely and depressed people tended to become. True email and chat rooms increased the quantity of relationships, but these were shallow, and the time they spent on them distracted from more important relationships with family and friends and intensive face-to-face -face contact with people. Turns out to be essential for security and happiness, less is more. The trend towards more but less rich relationships is more acute for apparent winners today. Money, rich, but time poor... And great believers in the market, but buy relationships there. Money rich, but time poor, and great believers in the market, but buy relationships there. I don't mean that they use prostitutes, although it's remarkable in many of these acquaintances who suddenly become rich immediately suffer marital difficulties. Not entirely unrelated to the strings of affairs, with more money, they want more relationships, not realizing that more is less. What I mean to do is that the winners contract relationships with a bewildering array of professional services, purveyors, personal trainers, personal assistants, personal coaches, pedicurists, shrinks, massage therapists, food consultants, hypnotists, aromatherapists, tennis coaches, communications advisors, advisors, spiritual guides, and God knows who else. Be good to yourself, they say. The marketing pattern working between 1990 and 2000, for example, the number of personal trainers in the United States doubled to over over 100,000 when it was managing consultants. Many firms believe very much of the personal relationship with the chief executive officer has prospered accordingly. Successful people may have little time for life at home, but they buy attention bite-sized chunks conveniently packed into what fits an executive agenda. The army of household assistants take care of the family, while the personal services providers pamper the breadwinners. It's all a ghastly mistake. Certainly each professional service provides something of value, but more is less. These commercial relationships substitute for a primary relationship that is essential for happiness. The professionals win. Everyone else loses. Why is more affluence not translated into more happiness? Why does prosperity corrode personal and social relationships? It's not the wealth itself. All other things being equal, increased comfort, health care and knowledge should raise human freedom and security and perhaps also generosity. It's down to a way that which we think and act. We're becoming utterly transfixed by one obsession. More with more. We want more money, more goods, more friends, more relationships, more sex, more attention, more comfort, more houses, travel, more gadgets, public acknowledgement. We're prepared to pay dearly for these aspirations. We would more and more spend more and more time for more attention, more energy, and frankly, more of our souls and ourselves to work to invest to pay the more stuff. Yet the economy works well because it follows a different principle, that of more with less. Economic life is a constant quest for more with less, better, faster, and yet cheaper goods and services. Less is made more. Human happiness, like true personal success, is immutable, driven by the same laws. Less is more and more with less. There's an unavoidable trade-off between quality and quantity. More means worse, and only by focusing on what's genuinely important to us. The few people, relationships, activities, and causes which we really, we really care about that we become centered, authentic and powerful, loving and loved. There is only other there's no other way. The only way to enjoy more with less in relationships and life is plain. Create more with less in work life, gaining more money and enjoyment with less time without eating into your family's personal life. 
Gain more with less by saving so that sooner or later you'll have an investment income to pay for the lifestyle you want and not depend on an ultra-demanding job. Focus on less is more, which is important for your happiness, satisfying work, and a sense of personal purpose. And above all, few high-quality relationships, which require and will uh, amplify and, amp and amply repay unstinting time and emotional commitment. Quality versus quantity. Almost certainly, 80% of the satisfaction from relationships flows from 20% of few of the relationships. Good news. We can focus attention on a few key relationships. We don't have to worry about the unimportant relationships. Action to high happiness. Put most time, energy, and attention, creativity, and imagination into few most important relationships. Ask what proportion of which effort goes into the most important relationships. The few that deliver most of your satisfaction. Probably these 20% of key relationships take more than 20% of an energy to devote to the relationships. How much more? 40%, 60%, unless you're devoting at least 80% of your relationship energy to the 20% of your key relationships, you can increase your happiness by doing so. Good news. Satisfaction can soar even within increasing your total amount of relationship energy. Simply by focusing energy on key relationships, action to hike happiness, redirect energy so that at least 80% of the relationship energy goes into a few key relationships. Why do telephone companies everywhere around the globe give us seven-digit phone numbers? Because we can remember a sequence of seven numbers but not eight or nine we can only care deeply about a few people unless we limit the number of people who are central to our lives nobody will be cared about the ultimate trade-off between quantity and quality comes from one relationship that can be central to our happiness with your heart you have your energy of relationships and how you fill your heart you have a top relationships or other relationships you want to take your heart from being filled mostly of other relationships and the percentage from top relationships needs to grow. Energy to relationships. Happiness to relationships. Energy to relationships. Happiness to relationships. So today you need to change from your energy in other relationships and put the energy into the top relationships. So that tomorrow all of your energy will be in your top relationships. Someone to love. Figure 11, moving energy into key relationships. Someone to love is a recent study by psychologists Diner and Seligman found that with only one exception, everyone in their top 10% of extremely happy people was in a romantic relationship. Another revealed a fact that 40% of married Americans say that they are extremely happy, while only 20% of Americans who have not yet married claim the same. Finding the right partner is a ticket to happiness for many people. Yet at the time, effort and intelligence that we don't devote finding a mate is often very limited. Harvard professor George Zip showed that 60 or 70% of the marriages he studied in Philadelphia in 1931 were between people who had lived within a few blocks of each other. Within 30% of the area that they've studied, the whole of Philadelphia was too big of a place for most residents to trawl for love. As for looking out of town, forget it. Most romances still spring from a local neighborhood, a small circle of friends, or colleagues at work. Many people follow the bus stop, approach to love. They take the first lover who comes along. They fall in love with love. The first of all the things is love is at first sight usually doesn't work. Love at first sight doesn't usually work. Commitment to a life partner based on large sexual attraction and performance in bed is a poor bed as well. Sex is wonderful, but sooner or later that appeal will fall, and that appeal will pall. A long-term relationship needs more. True love, mutual admiration for each other, and excitement can move mountains to make even the most unlikely relationships work, but romantic love may not last. To be happy over the long haul, consider four wider qualities. Being able to get close to one another, depend on them, and have them depend on you. There are three sorts of people. Secure people for whom intimacy and dependency are easy. Those who avoid commitment and intimacy. When care is needed, they run for sidelines. Anxious people who are uncertain of love and dispense care compulsively all the time, whether their love wants it or not. A few minutes reflection should reveal the type of any potential partner are. Where two secure individuals, the prospect for successful relationships are very good. If only one individual is secure, the odds are far less favorable, but still reasonable. If neither person is secure, the chances are poor. If you are, if you are not a secure yourself person, to be happy in the long term, you must select a secure partner. Being optimistic. Do you and your positive mate search for the silver lining of the cloud? When things are going wrong, opt optimistics look for temporary or specific explanations. The boss was in a foul mood, or I was up to half the last, and I was up half last late last night. Pessimists assume deep-seated permanent problems. I'm not good at my job. That problem won't go away. Choose an optimistic partner 
or one willing to learn optimism, it can be learned. Ability to avoid harsh argument and criticism of partner. Professor, Professor John Gottman uses a love lab, a love lab to observe the behavior of partners. Nine times out of ten, he correctly predicts divorce. Nine times out of ten, he correctly predicts divorce. Gottman's danger signals are frequent fierce arguments, criticizing the mate in personal terms, showing contempt, being chilly or withdrawn or being unable to take criticism. Ensure that you have a trial period from which two or you get closer without final commitment. If you experience Gottman's signals, walk. Agreement on basic values. Select someone who has some basic values or fundamental issues such as honesty, money, kindness, or whatsoever is crucial to you. Choose your lover after deep deliberation. Don't drift into a relationship. Search far and wide for a right person. Know the few qualities from which you want in a partner. Experience test whether the relationship really works before you fully commit. Take your time. There are many stages and grad grad gradations of commitment. Don't rush them. An increasing sense of certainty should develop naturally. Any relationship only has a few vital requirements. Often we don't inquire closely enough from what these are, so we act randomly, frittering away from our energy on our actions that lead nowhere. Good news. Focusing on a few things that matter make all the difference between success and failure in relationships. Action to hike happiness. In key relationships, identify few actions that lead to the greatest happinesses. Concentrate the effort on them. A wide friend once told me, a wise friend once told me, we are all different and things that are all important to me are often very important to my wife. We are all different and things that are not important to me are often very important to my wife and the other way around. In our marriage, this is what really matters to her. She wants me to be home on time. She wants me to always be able to rely on me. She loves flowers. She loves me supporting her in her projects. She adores surprises. There's not necessarily things that I would most want to do for her. I would take care of the candlelight dinners. I could buy a car that I'd like myself, take her on a great vacation. I could do all sorts of things, but nothing would impress her if I haven't met the basic few needs that mean most to her. Don't do for others what you would like for yourself. Do what your partner wants. Another couple has many marital problems. In a candid moment, the wife confided, What Peter doesn't realize is that he just bought me a home a bunch of flowers every week or two. It wouldn't do anything for him. I wouldn't do anything for him. How sad and unnecessarily a little effort for the right type required such a huge reward. How many marriages are barren, loveless places because the simple needs for a partner are not being met. And yet, the springs of love could easily be unstopped and overflowed again. Happy families. Just before South America was conquered, the Indians in Peru spotted Spanish sailing ships in the Horizon. Not knowing what ship looked like, what they looked like, they didn't realize that these could contain soldiers. Assuming that the boats were a freak of the weather, the Indians ignored the warning. We also deprived ourselves of a vital knowledge from which we don't know what we're looking for. Our relationships aren't only romantic ones or only are important ones to an obvious include to our children. Those of us who didn't have a particularly happy childhood often repeat the sad pattern as parents because we don't know how happy families work. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Tolstoy's and Karenina. There is a formula for happy families that we can copy. Happy families practice love spirals. Most parents love their children, but in happy families, the parents demonstrate, demonstrate their love all the time. You have to demonstrate your love all the time. Raising children is difficult. The intensity of family life is such in things that can only go two ways. One is a downward spiral and the baby screams, kids break something, mishaps occur, stressed parents respond with criticism or punishment, the kids scream louder and things get worse and worse. The other is an upward spiral. Kids are cute, adventurous, smiling. They love learning and attention. Even mother's mere presence makes good child feel secure and happy. Parents take pride in their children and practice small acts of love, which make the children even more and more playful and sunny. This turns elicits further love from the parents and so on. Both spirals are evident in all families. Yet, in happy families, the positive spirals outweigh the negative ones. Over time, the children are happy families because most secure and content will usually reinforce the positive spirals. The parents set the tone by their early actions. When the family is just starting and their first baby is born, by creating a reinforcement of positive spirals diffusing the negative ones, the baby, the parents slowly but surely craft a happy family. The return on early acts of the parental love is enormous. For relatively a small little effort, there is a massive benefit for the child and the whole family. Happy families use more positive than negative feedback. Researchers at one school noticed that a teacher praised good work and blamed bad 
and, and blame bad behavior. In an experiment, teachers were strained to praise both good work and good behavior and ignore bad behavior. Soon, the bad behavior largely vanished. At home, two praise is more effective than blame. Creating upward spirals, the 80-20 way exalts praise. Praise is easy, and the return is over a lifetime of a child is immense. Praise to a child's development is water as water is to a plant. The tiniest encouragement leads massive flowering. Capable, well-intentioned child will have terrific positive impact on other people throughout life. A little praise for a child today has enormous lasting benefits try counting the number of times from which your spouse says yes or no to your children make a conscious effort to say yes more and no less count again a week later see the differences it makes happy families have parents who are always available and generous with their time close bonding parents close between Close bonding between parents and a child creates security and happiness throughout life. Children don't understand the concept of quality time. They want attention all the time, and they are right. The 80-20 way is to give more care and love to fewer people. The people you care about most all the time spent with the one child and children in time well spent, with the enormous payoff the child and the rest of the family for society. If you really want and can't be available for your children, make sure that you are elsewhere or invisible, that you are elsewhere or invisible. Absence can be accepted. Busy being too busy when you are when you are visible cannot happy families are united and loving parents happy families are united and loving parents children are shrewd skilled negotiators they love playing off one parent against the other they find conflicting intriguing and sometimes empowering at all costs quash such games parents need to show that they love one another even when they are annoyed the parent, the payoff is that forcing love to win over grumpiness will make you a happier person too. Happy families can cope with the disaster of difficult children. Happy families, by and large, do not have easier time with an unhappy family. Just cope better than with the challenges. If your children being prepared for the possibility of a difficult child, children are unpredictable, free agents, and they can shock you. Some friends have a difficult son, yet coped with it very well, and I asked them how. Well, we went on as parent effectiveness training, said the father. They divided problems into three categories. There are own problems caused by the parents or the rest of the family. There are the shared problems created by the child and the family together, and there are the child's own problems essentially unrelated to the family each type requires a different solution when we are counseled his wife added we found that the most conflicting fl flowed from the son's problems we were trained to change our responses from Charles the son had problems we offered suggestions to him that left him in and decide what was he was gonna do this reduced family conflict by three quarters our family's life became far more happier Charles was happier because he stopped because we stopped telling him what to do all the time happy families impose discipline but never withdraw love happy families impose discipline but we don't withdraw love punishment works but only when the limits of acceptable behavior are completely clear so the child knows that he or she is being punished and what he's being punished for withdrawing privileges for a time is safe and it is effective it must always be clear for the punishment is for the action and isn't for a reflection on the child's character remember punishment is for his action he did not on him or his character but on the action he did Whatever the child has done, never suspend warmth, affection, or love. Some very good friends learn the hard way. They have two boys, now in their late teens, both intelligent, charming. Over the years, however, they had major problems with Daniel, the younger child. When he was 11, Daniel stole some money money and successfully for a time deflecting the blame onto an innocent schoolmate daniel's mother feeling the radical action was necessary withdrew her affection from daniel for a month she refused to talk to him without having anything to do with him her action proved disastrous when she realized her mistake she tried to make up for it to very close love attention and constructive action over the next five years but daniel therefore the whole family continued to have significant problems partly caused the withdrawal of the love never withdraw the love for any difficult time Punishment is not the only, nor usually the best, way of imposing discipline, but when faced in a crying, pouting, and demanding child, it's tempting to punish or give the kids, or give the way the kids' demands for the sake of peace. Instead, however, the child can be told that whining won't work, but a smiley face might do the trick. If from the age of four you reward smiley faces more than screams and pouts, guess what your child will tend to go for? Happy families share bedtime stories and best moments. The 10 to 20 minutes before a child falls asleep are the most priceless and influential. Reading a suitable story demonstrates the love and tends a child off to sleep with the store of a dreaming material. One friend's kids love their bedtime stories because dad makes up stories that include them as the key characters. You can work all the stories in advance and make an imaginative friend for your ideas. Another great idea is to ask your children, what do you like doing? What do you like doing today? If they remember all the good things, they will go to sleep they will go to sleep in the peaceful and satisfied frame of mind. Some psychologists believe that the practice helps the innocent child again 
an in, an inocul- helps the inoculate children against depression by helping them remind themselves of the highlights throughout their day before they go to sleep. Given the value of this time, both the children directly and cement cemetery your bond with them make this a daily habit have your children go over the highlights of the day the effort is small but the rewards are enormous friends aside from family whose death will leave you desolated count those people who are your key friends the twenty percent who can contribute eighty percent of the meaning of value to you most people come up with ten or fewer names although they usually know hundreds or two hundred people my address book lists of two hundred seven friends which only eighteen of these are truly significant to me these friends are less than nine percent of the total yet you give me ninety percent of my friendship pleasure which of how much time you spend with your key friends and with other friends you may be surprised you're more likely to spend more time with your neighbor than whom you are moderately than you thought is your best friend if they aren't in a dist- if they're in a distant town you'd probably be happier on the other way around try to live near your best friends in any case see them frequently the 80 20 way to a greater love step one focus on the 80 20 destination as your question in opposite sex Ask you to answer the questions. As you answer the questions of opposite, remember less is more. Be more selective and focus on the depth that truly matters to you in your life. My 80-20 destination for a greater love. Number one, do I want and need to find a lover? Number two, do I want to make a specific person my lover? Number three, do I need to do things differently to be sure of keeping my lover? Four, do I want a happy family? Am I ready for commitment and actions needed to raise happy children? Number five, do I want to see my best friends more often? Step two, find the 80-20 route. How can you obtain more with less, deeper commitment and love with less angst and striving? My 80-20 route to greater love. Number one, if I don't have a love from whom I'm fully committed, what type of person do I want to love for a long haul? I want to love for the long haul. Do I want a secure person? Do I want an optimistic person? Do I want someone who can avoid harsh personal criticism and frequent arguments? Do I want someone who is a agrees with my basic values what are these number two do I know anyone I might want as my lover are they secure are they optimistic are they able to avoid harsh criticism and arguments do they share my basic values number three where am I most likely to find the right lover what actions could I take to meet him or her which actions would give her me the best result for any energy from which I'd enjoy most number four do I know the few things that keep my lover happy try asking what are the few actions I need to take every day or every week to deliver my lo- on my lover's key needs number five can I raise happy fam- can I raise a happy family can I practice love spirals can I give much more positive than negative feedback can I be able for my children and generous with my time can I be able and available for my children and generous with my time are my partner and I united and loving? Could I cope with disaster with difficult children and keep being loving? Can I impose standards but never withdraw love? Do I spend the last 15 minutes of each child's day with them? If I want to see my best friends more often, how am I going to arrange this? Which routes give me the best solution for at least effort and expre- of expense? Step 3. Take the 80-20 action. 80-20 action for greater love. What are the three most important actions that I should take now? Action 1. Action two, action three, where can I take energy away from a superficial, unimportant relationship and put it into my three key actions? Modern norms are out of kilter with our deepest needs of love and affection. In pursuit, more and more, many societies, most successful people are putting their jobs and careers into the number of variety of relationships that they enjoy. Inevitably, most of these relationships are superficial and unsatisfying. In devoting energy to a large number of relationships and to work, they deprive themselves of a meaningful and joy that flows from a few central relationships and one love affair. In relationships, above all, less is more. Chapter 8, The Simple Good Life. The ability to simplify means to eliminate the unnecessary so that the necessary may speak. Artist Hans Hoffman. Thinking about lunch, the vacationing businessman stared at the calm blue sea, a small boat laid in a large yellow fin tuna docked near the pretty Mexican village. A lone fisherman jumped ashore. That's a great catch, said the tourist. How long did it take you? Not so long, replied the Mexican. What, did you stay out longer and catch more fish? Why didn't you stay out longer and catch more fish? That's not enough to keep a family provided for. What do you do with the rest of your time? Sleep late, fish a little, play with my children, have lunch, take a siesta with Maria, my wife, stroll into a village each evening, sip wine, play guitar, cards with my amigos, a full and rich life, senor. I think, 
I could help you, the visitor said, wrinkling his nose. I'm a Harvard MBA. This is the advice you'd get from business school. Spend more time fishing, buy a bigger boat, make more money, than several boats until you've got a fleet. Don't sell to catch to the middleman. Sell directly to the processor, eventually opening your own cannery. You'd control the product, production, and distribution, and then you could leave this small town behind, move to Mexico City, then to Los Angeles, perhaps eventually to New York City, to run your expanding firm. But, senor, how long would this take? Fifteen, twenty years? But what then, senor? Well, that's the best part. The businessman laughed. When the time it's right, you could float on your stock market and make millions of dollars. Hmm, millions, you say. But what then, senor? Then you could retire and go home, move to a pretty village by the sea, sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take a siesta with your wife, stroll to the village evening, sip wine, play guitar and cards with your friends. What is the good life? Three centuries before Christ, Greek philosophers debated that much made of the good life, perhaps the most convincing view came from Epicurus, who took his own advice and lived very happily. I don't know how I could imagine the good life, he said. If I take away the pleasures of taste, if I take away sexual pleasure, the pleasures of hearing, of sweet emotions caused by seeing beautiful forms, Epicurus said that all we need for happiness is, bullet point one, food, shelter, and clothes, friends, freedom, and your thoughts. To live one's entire life in happiness, he said, the greatest is far by possession of friendships, handful of true friends. He took to a house outside Athens and moved to his seven friends. Never eat alone, he advised. Eating with friends is much better. Epicurus circle valued freedom to avoid unpleasant work that formed a commune. They, gra they grew cabbages, onions, and artichokes, and relished their independence. They exchanged ideas and wrote books. Life was simple, far from lavish, but fully satisfying. Luxurious foods and drinks, Epicurus said, do not produce freedom from harm or of healthy condition. We must regard wealth beyond this as natural, as no more use than water to a container that is full to overflowing. Epicurus and his friends believed that less is more. Contrast with this in the modern more with more compulsion. A recent survey of AOL subscribers asked how much more money they, could, they would need for them to be free of worrying about money. It turned out that those, those with incomes over 100000 thought that they needed far more money than those with incomes under 40000 The higher earners more five times more likely to say they needed at least another 90000 annual income. This should tell us that once we pursue more with more, we can never ever win, never be satisfied. It's not to innate greed and propels us towards wanting more with more. It's the structure of modern life and its compelling insidious assumptions. Modern life insists that success is a matter of more money. More money means more work and only the fast track and slow track and the fast track requires us to to lay out huge efforts of huge rewards and worry about what we're doing. We work more than we want. We buy more than we can value. We cut ourselves off from the simple joys of romantic love, family, friends, and abundant time. But what if we really possible to get more with less? Then we can experience the marvelous part of modern life, the challenge of exciting work and discovery of our talents, material plenty, while also relishing control of our time and rich personal relationships. We share the circle of focusing on our high value activities, those of high value to other to other people and to ourselves and cutting out the trivial ones we simplify we purify we intensify we relax all at once more with more is like the imperial's new clothes everyone professes that this is the way to live although nobody who searches their own soul can really see the point we are all swept along by a near total unanatomy that is the emperor's outfit is magnificent yet within each of us lurks the ability at any moment to blurt out that what we really know and feel that the emperor is all in all together the more with more leads less leads less fraternity and happiness. More with less leads to a life of higher quality, worth, and deep personal satisfaction. Since the pursuit of more with less runs counter to modern life, we must make a deliberate decision to step off the more with more treadmill. Why does this seem so difficult? There are perhaps three reasons. Our desires are infinite and contradictory. We are restless, ambitious, and conditioned to think more that more is better. We're constantly training and conditioned to think that more is better. We compare ourselves to other people at some friends becoming richer, we, we, which we don't want to fall behind. If the neighborhood neighbor has a new car, we want one too, even though I'm perfectly happy with my old one. Even if I'm lucky enough to own a yacht, I'll notice the owner of the next berth has bought her a bigger one, more powerful radar. Many of us believe that ambition, effort, and strivings are good. That must develop our abilities and reach for the stars. We feel guilty that we're not competing, struggling to go further. But you can leave the treadmill with a light heart. However, since the vast majority of our desires don't lead to more, the more of the fleeting happiness, 
To be happy, we need to focus on demands, boiling them down to a few of the most important to us. The result is in our happiness. When we desires come alive, we exclude them, not because that they are work of the devil, but because we know that we won't, they won't make us happy. We stop worrying. We simplify. Comparing our goods to the neighbors, as an old humanity, Adam and Eve surely compared their fig leaves in Moses' tenth commandment, forbade hankering after a neighbor's housewife, houseboy, os pair, ox, or ass. But the consumer, the, the consumer society raises the temptation of an art form. The advertising marketing industry has rendered us addicting to joyless comparison of acquisition of goods. Our economy revolves around the pointless, never ending race for more, in which we compare ourselves with our neighbor and better to compare relative wealth or happinesses with relatives. Moses should come said, come on friends, covet anything you like, but realize that it's been scientifically proven that possessions don't lead to happiness. Now, would you rather have lots of houses, slaves and cattle, or just be happy? Do you have too many possessions or too many? Do you have too few possessions or too many? Would your long-term happiness be great if you added complexity or, or if it was simplified? Do you use all the possessions for which you answer and look in the closets? Have you simplified your wardrobe in the point from which it contains only the clothes you wear frequently? Or is it stuffed with 80% of the clothes you wear less than 20% of the time? Stretching and cultivating ourselves is good. We become happier, more individuals, the more we use the other people. But striving to the point from which we're stressed out, time, poor, snappy, and unhappy is stupid. But we do more good when we are relaxed and focused. We add most to the happiness of those in love from which are happy ourselves. We are happiest when we simplify our lives down to the essentials that work best for us. In a happiness point, in figure three, the happiness point of possessions is on the left, happiness going from down up, from low to high, happiness, and then at the bottom, possessions from less to more. You have to find your point, your happiness point, from which you have a simple, spacious beauty, enough useful to the self and others, able to choose work and able to offer hospitality of your happiness point, ideal with your possessions, your Ornate, cultured, fussy, too much, or display, only wary some, look after, and showing off. You have to find your happy point, and your happiness point with your happiness and your possessions. The happiness point for effort and striving is you have to stretch to strive for your ideal point. Fighting greed, anxiety, possessions, complexity, duty, no time for self and friends, crushing responsibilities just for these material things. When you should focus on focusing your purpose, develop yourself, simplicity, fulfillment, time for self and others, and you have enough money. Get to your happiness point in your high happiness and your effort and strivings. The happiness point is the degree from which effort and strivings that make us happiest in the long term. From where in the curve you should be happier and more developed from more striving or with less. To jump off the treadmill requires a clean break, decisive action to reject the worries and complexities of modern life. Crafting instead of our own simple, good life, confident that we can create more with less. Anne finds the simple, good life. Anne's a close friend, and in her 20s, she was successfully an account executive in an advertising. At 29, she made an abrupt shift. She quit her job. And she had never had another. For 10 years, she simplified her life by doing things she wanted to do, creating activities of one kind of another. She was having fun in advertising. She told me that she was making good money. One day, I sat down and asked myself if I really wanted to do that with my life. And the answer was clear. I wanted to paint, sculpt, write music, and play the piano, learn how to play other instruments, pursue my own projects. I didn't want to climb a corporate ladder or get stuck in traffic and do all the office work as, as a boss, run the rat race. Better to work at home and control my life, be free to walk in the sunshine, see a friend, above all, develop my creative side, see where that took me. I moved out of my big house, bought a one-room pretty studio, great mezzanine floor beneath the skylight. Paren parents went nuts, especially dad. They made sacrifices so I can get to a university. We're proud of my progress, my lifestyle. They didn't understand how I followed my path. I didn't want to die rich with the music still inside me. Kept asking me where the money was going to come from. A good question. When I earned good money, I spent a lot. I had some things from which I was in my deposit studio, but soon I found that I didn't need to spend much. No expenses going to work. I didn't need to flash a sporty car, expensive clothes, impress clients. I didn't need to eat fancy restaurants. For the first year, it was quite regular work. I made my first and third income before, and I paid very little in tax. I found that I could live by selling traits and sculptures, individuals, and families. The, the paint was there. The point was there. If I only did the things I wanted to do, I was much happier. I tried various ways of making money, but one condition that I had enjoyed to express myself at the same time. The weird thing was is that in the past five years, I've begun to make good money again too, while self-employed and still doing precisely what I chose. How to leave the more with more treadmill. Resolving to seek more with less is difficult because you have to shake off the erroneous assumptions of modern life. However, having made the commitment to less is more, the process will find is not that hard. Why? It's a process of subtraction. We don't need to do more. We need to do less. We have to reach into the unknown. We can simplify back down to the best of the most fulfilling parts of our life we've already have. We don't have to try to get more. We're giving up grasping. We let go. Relax. Our natural happiness is inside is released. We don't strive for more 
effective habits. We drop habits that don't work for us. We stop spending time on anything that doesn't bring us happiness and fulfillment. That isn't necessarily for our living or our happiness of the people which we care about. We don't have to say yes when people ask us to do things. We could just ask ourselves, is this something I really want to do with this part of my life that I want? If the task doesn't connect with some way with your purpose from which we say, just say no. We do less. We enjoy more. We take items off our list. Less work, less shopping. Less clear the closet clutter. Give away from which we don't need. Recycle them. Give up feeling angry or depressed. Close off an old grudge. Forgive our enemies or harder our friends. Stop comparing ourselves to others. Be content with being happy. And happy is what we have. Happy from what we have. Stop striving after things that make restless and make you restless and unhappy. Edit our lives. Cut the unsatisfying meetings, travel, relationships, and something not going anywhere. Stop it. Modern life may advocate expenses, difficult training, to cope with difficulties a shrink guru motivational expert suppose trains us to deal better with stress or our bad behaviors this is learning all above snakes to deal with them in the better this is like learning all of the above snakes to deal with them better why bother rather give up or avoid snake pits areas of your life from which we cope badly less is more dump the stressful and unrewarding parts of your life there's always a way if we were determined I have a home in Spain. I go there every few months to escape business commitments, to focus on thinking and writing. I limit my information inflow. No radio, no TV. Few phone calls, secret number, one phone, no backup, no mobile. Happily, the phone system often fails. See only a few friends I really want to see. Read the newspaper only on Sunday. Results? I write three or four times faster and I think much better. And when I'm elsewhere, I love my simple life in Spain. Enjoy an hour of writing, daily cycle through the mountains, tennis, dinner, friends, simple life, sweet rituals each day, very cheap. Think about the simple economics that make you happy. Read the ideas and simplify your life. And look at Jane's pleasure chart opposite. And how fewer expenses, pleasures, and more simple ones. Draw your own pleasure chart and blank one provided on 138. The simple life means less and more. A chart. The simple life means less work you don't like to do and you aren't good at, things done on duty, routine, less activities from which low turn on your energy, less time waiting for worrying, less time seeing people you don't like, places you don't like, phone calls, travel commuting, less driving, exercise you don't like, crises, less taking the rough with the smooth, information overload, spending, less habits you don't enjoy, less big things that make little differences, and have more of. More work that you like and you're good at, fun and recreation, more surprises, more activities with a high return on your energy, more events you enjoy, more seeing good friends, more places you like, more time to think, peace and quiet, more walking and cycling, exercises you like, thinking to avoid crises, more taking smooth with the smooth, more information on your special interests, giving you away, more giving away, more recycling, more daily rituals you love, little things that make a big difference, ideas to simplify your life. From low to high, your happiness generated. From the bottom up, simple pleasures to your high happiness generated. From left to right at the bottom, your money spent. From your simple pleasures low to your expensive pleasures high. You want to work on your happinesses and then your money spent. From visiting your daughter to a New Zealand, a love relationship, sports car, playing with kids, voluntary work, reading a book, paid work to enjoy, sex, receiving flowers, giving treats to children, playing cards, deck chair in a garden, walking the sun, reading newspapers, enjoying a joke, morning coffee, jogging, keeping a dog, sailing, sports cars, round the world trips, dream house. Find out what you like as far as your simple and simplify your life. Figure 15 is Jane's pleasure chart. Figure out your own pleasure chart. From high to low, happiness generated, from money spent, pleasures to expensive pleasures. The 80-20 way is to simplify the good life. Step one, focus on your 80-20 destination. What is the ideal, simple life, good life for you? What would your life be simpler? How would your life be simpler? How would your ideal life be different? Step two, find the 80-20 route. The challenge is to find something that is both better and simpler. Offer more with less. To simplify, eliminate the things of your life that cause you worry, unnecessary aggravation, and give very little benefit relative to the energy or time you expand on them. Eliminate the worry, often too much choice of too many ambitions. It's just impossible to be over-focused on, under-focused on your goals and a destination. Avoid the snake pits. What are your personal snake pits? What could you do to avoid them or avoid spending so much time on them? The 55 way, the 50-5 way, is getting rid of the things that don't matter. Having rid yourselves of negative things, let's dump as many things in our life that absorb our energy, but give almost nothing back. The 80-20 way has a close companion, the 50-5 way. 50% 50 of what you do usually leads to the trivial amount of 5% of happiness and results. Activities in our lives in a circle chart cut equally in half 50-50. 
The top 50% of our activities lead to 95% of what's good for us. The bottom, for, the, the bottom percent of our activities lead to the 5% of what's good for us. Figure the 50-5 way. Which task clutters your life, yielding little happiness or results? How can you chop them? Which simple expensive luxuries could you substitute for expensive luxuries? More of these simple luxuries, fewer of these expensive luxuries. How are you going to do this? Could you imagine a life where most of your days were full of your own favorite simple luxuries? How could you move towards this ideal life? Step three, take an 80-20 action. What are the three immediate simple action steps towards your destination, the steps that take you further towards your simple good life with the least energy? Action one, action two, action three. Are you going to start today or next week? When these steps are completed, take another three steps until you reach the La Dolce Vida. A life that challenges and stretches you in a way you want. Free you from yourself from worry and tyranny and more with more. When you realize that less is more and focus on the few things that matter, it's always possible to find more with less. A professional and personal life that is simple, refreshing, and constructed around that each of us loves doing. Part 3. Making it happen. Chapter 9. The Power of Parsimonious. Positive Action. If to do were as easy as to know what were good to do... Chapels would be churches and poor men's cottages, princes, palaces. William Shakespeare, the merchant of Venice. Two identical twins, Julie and Sandra, are very shy. A great mutual friend is giving a party and that really wanted and I that really they really wanted to attend. So they decided to cure their shyness. They would turn up a self help section of their local bookstore. Julie buys a bookseller about positive thinking by a famous motivational coach. She learns that she must supply her shyness. She knows that she must suppress her shyness. Whenever she feels shy, bing, she would dismiss the thought. She would tell herself that she isn't shy anymore. The inside of her introverted personality there is an extrovert and that can be liberated. On the afternoon of the party, Julie was having second thoughts. She was thinking, I've always been awkward at parties. Let's not go. But then she tries to stimulate some positive thinking. She says to herself, nonsense, my girl. You can be the life and the soul of the party. Let's pretend that you're not shy at all, and you won't be. Just before leaving to her calm nerves and help awaken her extroverted within, she has a large vodka and tonic. In the taxi with Sandra, Julie feels all pumped up, positive thinking, working, but when they arrive to the party, her senses and the vodka wearing off, the bar is crowded, and she gets anxious as usual. She tries to feel positivity, but after 15 minutes, she hasn't talked to anyone, not even Sandra, who's deep in conversation with a gorgeous young man. Not wishing to interrupt the feeling as a bad or as ever, Julie leaves after a half an hour. Only answer is to no more parties. Perhaps she can meet a man at work. At breakfast, Julie asks Sandra, how is it going? Great, says Sandra, noticing Julie depressed face too late. How, Julie asks, did you manage to suppress your shyness? The thing is, I didn't. When you were all bubbly in the taxi, I was anxious as ever of dreading the party, but the book I bought told me not to worry about feeling timid, just to take some positive action. So I said to myself, however bad I feel, Sandra, you're going to go up to the first man you like and introduce yourself and say something, anything. You're going to do this within 10 minutes of arriving. And the first man isn't friendly, that's okay. Try it to two other men, and if it doesn't work, so you don't have to worry about talking to anyone else. Or at least you've tried. So I saw that this cute guy with the blue shirt asked him to a dance. I was watching carefully, and I think he uh, half smiled at me. Anyway, he said yes and introduced me to his friends. After two dances, I wasn't nervous anymore. What was the book? Oh, I've got it upstairs. Some funny title with numbers in it. Positive thinking may work for a small minority of people but who are natural optimists, but they don't need help. The problem with positive thinking is that much in advice from self-help gurus, it can be unrealistic and lead us to deny our emotions. Kidding ourselves that black is white does not usually work for long. We cannot change how we feel about life very easily and quickly, nor do we need to. All of us are bound to a continue of having a negative emotions, feeling down, anxious, angry or weak. These emotions are valuable because they tell us something useful about ourselves. Emotions should be accepted, not crushed. We should use our deliberate think capacity, talk to our emotions, and reason with them. Treat emotions like people from whom you, we agree. Instead of interrupting them and have a cup of tea with them, have a cup of tea with them. Let them have their say. Admit your feelings and yet resolve and act positively. Julie attempted to quash her shyness, but it simply popped up again in the party and caused her spirits to sag. Sandra did not beat down her shyness. She... And so she saw, not depressed, she felt shy, and she didn't feel shy anymore. She accepted that she was shy, and she might as well come back with the party feeling bad. But she decided to take a few actions and had the result that she wanted. When she took an action, she was shy and admitted to herself, yet she focused herself to act, and before her long action had changed everything, including her feelings. 
In the Nazi death camps, the writer, the therapist, Victor Frank, knew that his chances of survival were slim. He calculated the odds, 28 to 1 against, that there was no power to power to positive thinking as Auschwitz, being unrealistic, led straight to the gas oven. Yet Frank acted positively. When I was taken to Auschwitz, he wrote, a manuscript of mine ready to be publication was confiscated, confiscated. When at camp on Bavaria, I felt ill with typhus fever. I jotted down a little scraps of my paper. Many notes intended to enable me to rewrite the manuscript should I live at the day of liberation. I'm sure to the reconstruction of my last manuscript in the dark barracks of a Bavarian concentration camp assisted me in overcoming the danger of a cardiovascular collapse. Frank also composed speeches in his head and imagined himself giving them to an audience after the war so that the death camps could never reoccur. Though he thought of it extremely unlikely that he would survive, he stopped worrying and took all the positive action he could. He reconstructed a book, Man's Search for Meaning, sold over nine million copies. The Library of Congress voted in one of the ten most influential books of the 10th, 20th century. He reconstructed this book, Man's Search for Meaning, sold over nine million copies. The Library of Congress voted in one of the, as one of the most ten influential books of the 20th century. Victor Frank did not deny his emotions. His book is oblique and unrealistic about the horrors in camp life. Still, he asked himself, what could I do the most possible work for giving me a reason to continue living? Then he acted. Even though in the most of his time he felt depressed, hungry, physically tormented, he couldn't attempt to think positively, but just to act positively. He noted that other individuals also managed to act positively. The experience of the camp shown that men did have a choice of action. Who has lived in a concentration camp can remember the men who walked throughout the huts, comforting others, giving a away their last piece of bread. If inmates of concentration camps can, make, can take positive action, can't we all? Next time you feel blue, ask what positive action you could take to change your mood. If you're stumped, try one, or all, or these. Stand upright. Stretch and smile at yourself in the mirror, then find another person to smile at, even if it's a stranger. Go for a long walk and take some, others ex and take some other exercise and perform an act of kindness. However bad our circumstances or emotions, we could take and change our lives by a few 80-20 actions. The relatively easy actions will make such a big difference in our happinesses and our happinesses of people around us. The Shakespeare quote at the beginning of the chapter is right. A lot more difficult acts than which we know from which we do. How many times we also resolve to do something positive only to resume our normal lives without making that decisive step. To change our lives, we must make it easier on ourselves. We have to achieve decisive change and do it without superhuman effort. This is where the 80-20 way is so different, so much more effective for two reasons. The 80-20 way does not require to change how you feel. It will then come later. Naturally, without strain, is our actions to produce the desired results. Two, we don't have to to increase our effort and energy, we almost have to breathe in our daily lives. By focusing on less is more, and the very few things from which really matter to us, we could transform our life and while actually exerting less effort, having fewer worries than now. If we highly selected about what we want and limit ourselves to the cue and key things and express our individuality, we could be lazier yet act more effectively. By using the idea of more with less, we could find much better solutions that use less energy. The secret of 80-20 action is to be parsimonious in our positive actions. Be stinging, stingy, and economical with your energy. Remember to be stingy and economical with your energy. There's a limited amount of it. Only use it in those few actions that can really make you happy and powerful. It's easier to change a few things if we do the things that we habitually think and feel. Take the few actions and get your feelings that will take care of themselves. All you have to do is reflect, then act. Work out what you want, the few things that are most important to you. This is the 80-20 destination. Work the easiest route for you, the few actions that will produce the results you want in the least strain and stress. This is the 80-20 route. And take a few most important steps along the route. This is the 80-20 action. So far in this book, we've concentrated on the thinking. Now it's time to experience less and more and more with less. The time to act. The good news is that we can apply 80-20 ways, 80-20 way to process of an 80-20 action. There's a simple action program that really does work, and here it is in our final chapter. 10. Your 80-20 Happiness Plan. Just do it. Nike slogan. There's a true story about a troop of a young Hungarian soldiers lost in the Alps during training in abysmal weather. With no food or supplies, they were cut off from their colleagues. After two days of snow and sleet, they were frozen and weak from hunger. They had no idea how to get back to the base. They lost the will to live. Then a miracle happened. Searching for a cigarette in the lining of his tunic, one of the soldiers suddenly found an old map. The soldiers confidently used the map to march through the mountains back to safety. It was only when there that they were warm in the fed the base camp that they discovered that it was a map of Pyrenees, some 2,000 kilometers away. The story has two valuable lessons. It's better to act constructively than to have the right answers and not to act. Each of us has to find our own answer and adapt something and something else, someone else answer to our own circumstances. 
the soldiers got home safely because they made sense of the map and themselves and related it to their immediate surroundings. Now is the time for you to act, to adapt the insights from the 80-20 way, to suit your own desires, inclinations, and needs. You can make your life very much better without fuss, bother, or superhuman effort. But this does require action. Bullet one, set aside a regular time and day to spend an hour a week on the 80-20 happiness plan. For example, 4 p.m. Sunday, any time slot will do, but stick to it to go over an 80-20 happiness plan. Ideally, get a friend to be your mutual mentor, another reader in the living 80-20 way who wants to change their life. Compare notes on your progress, perhaps meeting for a weekly 80-20 happiness plan hour. Complete your 80-20 happiness plan. This is easy. A summary of what you already decided and written down in part two. Figure 18 gives an example in the figure of 19. It's blank for you to complete. Hints for completing your 80-20 happiness plan. Number one, refer back to the notes you made in chapters four through eight. Make your 80-20 destination very specific, and once you have arrived at that destination, choose another specific one. Select the 80-20 routes that you will enjoy and it will take you to your destination. Choose a route that offers more or less. That is both rewarding and easier from what you would normally do. You must believe that you are capable of traveling through the route successfully. If not, pick an easier route. And always write down one, two, or three 80-20 happiness actions. List them in the order from which you will take them. Pick one of them in the five areas yourself, work, success, money, relationships, the simple good life to start with. The area picks in one uppermost of the minds of the moment where you most want things to improve in the area from which it's easier for you to act successfully in sequence means in order for you, you must tackle the five areas. You can review the sequences later after success in the first area. Date to start an action should be particularly a week, a month, or a year. Write in an actual date. An example, January 2005, to start action. Finish one 80-20 action before you move on to another. If any 80-20 route or action is not working, choose another, but give it a chance before you switch. Use your weekly 80-20 happiness plan hour to track progress using your 80-20 happiness plan progress chart. Carolyn's chart, figure 20, gives you the 90 and figures 21-32. Our progress charts to last you 12 months. Carolina has decided to attack the money area first. The left side of the figure 20 comes from straight from the money section of figure 18. The right side lists from the weeks. Caroline, Caroline enters the first 80-20 action. She completes the first week, then she inserts the second 80-20 action. Noting her headway each week, by the fourth week, she's found a Christmas vacation job. Taking care of the money area, she advances the following week and work into her success area. Hints for completing your 80-20 happiness plan progress chart. Bullet number one, under area, put the one that you've chosen to tackle first on the left-hand side. Repeat what you've written under the area on figure nine. On the right hand, enter the dates from which the week ends this month. And then write the 80-20 action. Note the progress on the right and the end of each week. First, when the first 80-20 action is completed, enter the second 80-20 action, and so on. If all the 80-20 actions are achieved within the month, celebrate. Take the rest off. Take the rest of the month off. Next month, move on to the second area. On the way to from work each day, remind yourself of your 80-20 action. Write in your diary or a postcard-sized index, cards placed in your purse or wallet. Even better, make an 80-20 action so simple that it's clear for you to remember all the time. Visualize yourself taking the 80-20 action to help make it a reality. Don't set deadlines for your 80-20 actions. Deadlines turn out way too easy or more often too hard. It's long as you're making a headway or continue your 80-20 actions until it's done. Some 80-20 actions will take all day. Others will take several months or years. If you don't feel that you're moving in a long, a night, along nicely, choose another action and route and start again. Be your own judge of progress. You're the beneficiary. On a chart, chapter, reading down, chapter... Area, 80-20 destination, 80-20 routes, 80-20 action, sequence, and action start date. From the top of the top of the chart, reading left to right, you have chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. In the areas you have yourself, your work, your success, your money, your relationships, your simple life, and your 80-20 destination. For yourself, you want to become an expert on care for stray dogs. 80-20 routes, you're going to find three mentors who are experts already. 80-20 action. Number one, identify best mentors. Two, work out how you can help them. And three, approach them. Sequence is five. There's five sequences. Action start date, later. Shh. Area of work and success. Find a job you really enjoy. 80-20 destination is find a job you really enjoy. 80-20 routes is train as a vet. 80-20 action is pass biology exams, visit vet colleges, and get accepted at chosen college. Money. 80-20 destination is avoid a deposit on my own home by 2007. 80-20 routes. Save and invest 10%. Income automatically. Take evenings and weekend jobs.
Money, 80-20 action. Is open a savings account and have 10% of my income deducted automatically. Find a job for vacation. Relationships, 80-20 destination. Find lover who is secure, optimistic, loving, and likes dogs. Relationships, 80-20 route. Meet women at animal rescue shelters and vet schools. Relationships, 80-20 action. Volunteer at a shelter and get to know Mrs. and Heather much better. Simple good life, 80-20 destination. Ideal life is spending all the time with animals and animal lovers. 80-20 routes. Persuade parents to let me finish school and go to a vet college. 80-20 action. Get to a top grade in biology and get Uncle Tom to persuade my parents. And take action. Break down in a chart. Your 80-20 destinations, your 80-20 routes, and your 80-20 actions. Fill out your own chart for your happiness plan. Fill out your own chart for your progress plan. Farewell. In Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, the Red Queens dragged Alice into a mad lash. They were running hand in hand, and the Queen went so fast, that was all she could do, was keep up with her. Still, and the Queen kept crying, faster, faster! But Alice felt that she could not go any faster. She had no breath to say so. The most curious part of the thing was that the trees and other things around them never changed their place at all. However fast that they went, they never seemed to pass anything. Now, now, cried the Queen, faster, faster, and they went so fast that they seemed to skim through air, hardly touching the ground with their feet. So suddenly, just like Alice was getting quite exhausted, they stopped. She found herself sitting on the ground, breathless and giddy, Alice looking around in a great surprise. Why do I believe that we've been under this tree this whole time? Everything was just as it was. Of course it was, said the queen. What would you have it? What, what, would, what would you have it? Well, in our country, said Alice, still painting a little, you generally get somewhere else. And you ran very fast for a long time, as we'd been doing. A slow sort of country, said the queen. Well, now here, you see, it takes all running that you can do to keep in the same place. And if you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. Lewis Carroll could have been satirizing today's fast-track world, which urges us to go faster and seek more with more. But as Alice found, when we speed up or exhaust ourselves without getting anywhere, the treadmill of modern life relentlessly cranks up. We run faster and faster, but it never arrives at a happiness. Like running at the gym, we sweat, we get tired, and then we stay there, where we were. The fast track bestows only the illusion of speed, like a theme park roller coaster. It's scary and thrilling, yet it takes us nowhere. If speeding up takes us nowhere, slow down and take us somewhere. Slowing down could take us somewhere, contrary to the common opinion, Less is more. Only by concentrating on few important and vital things and refusing to worry over the mass of trivial ones can we find happiness. Only by doing less can we live more. Only by insisting on more with less can we fulfill our individual destiny. We have seen this more with less in principle behind marvelous achievements in business, economics, science, and technology. The watchwords of success are focus, selectivity, and innovation. The 80-20 way translates the same principles to our individual lives. We don't have to accept the current fad, surely one that will seem bizarre and ridiculous to observe in a few decades ahead. Far more with more. More with more is stupid, but it wastes human potential to insult human intelligence and ingenuity. In flunks of an objective test of a social progress, more with more is just a wet dream for a misguided yuppie. To find the meaning of life, we have to reach inside ourselves, to find the few things that we care about, the things that we want to love and devote ourselves to, and the things that we are good and enjoy. Having found these things, everything else is trivial, fulfilled by a happy, creative more with less, that we can safely ignore the shrill fad from more with more, and faster, faster. But the 80-20 way still requires effort. And in this book, I've suggested more intelligent, worry-free path through life, an easier way to achievement and self-realization. More with less is much easier than more with more. Yet one respects the 80-20 way, it's harder. It is harder to start because all the assumptions of the modern world push us towards more and more and more with more. We need to self-confidence and resolve and leave the crowd. To reject more with more in favor of more with less requires less labor and yields happiness and fulfillment, yet also demands a degree of intellectual courage. We have to reject the modern treadmill and stop doing what other ambitious people are doing. We must get rid of more and more with more. We have to work with where there is less can be more and stick to our guns when friends and colleagues think we're nuts to dare to guess that we now believe in less is more and more with less but reading this book has been useless unless you start behaving differently albert einstein said that every problem should be made as simple as possible but not simpler the 80 20 way must make everything as easy as possible but not easier ultimately to make a life to take an action that will lead through a best life that you can make requires some new and different efforts otherwise you'd be in the robots of life wouldn't be any worth crafting nevertheless effort is effort 
effortless when driven by desire and love. Too often we des driven not by desire and not by what we love, but by a dread hand of guilt, worry, and duty. Duty, John Foles wrote, largely consists of pretending that the trivial is critical. Duty wastes life's energy. All great human accomplishments have been driven not by duty but by passion. Our lives are most enjoyable and valuable when we are driven by the few things that excite us. When we are not excited, nothing of any, nothing is of any use. If we are not ourselves, however, there is no limit to our happiness or achievement if we just act ourselves. The vision behind the 80-20 way is a world from where we as individuals responsible for ourselves, discovering and enjoying our unique place in this universe, leaving behind fond memories, happy children, and some enhancement of art, science, literature, or service to other people. It is an awesome to realize the most of life is trivial and most from which we do is unworthy to us. Of course we should sit down and think of mundane tasks of life, the cleaning, the washing up and need to make a living. What matters is how we do this and what we do. Anything that gives the meaning of life to us and our happiness is precious. But to drift aimlessly through life without happiness or making other people happy without realizing best of what we could become, what a waste. Yes, it takes a little effort to get the 80-20 way. You don't need 20-20 vision, but you do need 80-20 vision. Yes, it requires different attitude. Yes, you must stand out from the crowd, and yes, you must cast off the sticky chains of modern convention. Yes, it takes action, but yes, you can do it. Decide now that you will. Start to do it. Once you get the hang of it, it'll seem the easiest way of all. Without action, you may have enjoyed this book, but the pleasure will soon fade. My warm's wish to you to take with a few small but but directed actions that'll transform your life, enabling you to have happiness to overflow and flood the people around you, the ones you love, to multiply happiness. Start those few actions right away. The 80-20, living the 80-20 way, work less, worry less, succeed more, and enjoy more. Richard Coach, author of The 80-20 Principle.